the ugly truth behind bad IT, three roles for driving digital success, and an overview of ERP systems in the marketplace. Those are just a few of the topics we're going to cover today in episode number 135 of Transformation Ground Control. This is Transformation Ground Control. Your source for all things business, technology, strategy, and change. If you're growing your business, leading change within your organization, or undertaking any sort of operational or technology change initiative, this podcast is for you. This show covers what you need to know about digital transformation, organizational change, operational improvement, and business growth. Five, four, three, two, one. And now, here's your host, Eric Kimberly. Hello, welcome to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 135. This is the podcast that has everything to do with digital transformation, including the people, process, technology, and strategy aspects of change. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm the CEO of Third Stage Consulting. We're an independent consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world reach their third stage of digital transformation success. And joining me as always is Kyler Cheatham. Kyler, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate you having me. Yes, thanks for thanks for being here. We've got a great uh, episode for you today. Uh, a few, few things we're going to cover. Uh, first of all, new episodes every Wednesday. You can find new episodes of this podcast every week on streaming to LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as on audio podcast platforms throughout the world. So be sure to check us out wherever you listen or watch the podcast. Uh, opening segment today, we're going to get into some questions from the audience, and we're going to answer those questions. We'll have a couple hot topics. We're going to get into the ugly truth behind bad IT, and we're also going to talk about three roles for driving digital success. And then later in the show, our first guest is going to be Kristen Valentine, who's a vice president at Epicor Software. And she's going to be on the show chatting with me about an overview of ERP systems. And even though she's from Epicor, um, she works for Epicor. We are not affiliated with Epicor and we're not affiliated with any software vendors, but she's going to provide and help me provide a, a technology agnostic view of the ERP software marketplace. And, and uh, we'll dive into that later in the show. And then last but not least, we're going to play you a mashup of past digital stratosphere events. Um, we'll show you just some some uh, clips from past events and uh, give you some of the highlights from some of the, those past events. And we're also going to share with you a, a discount code or a coupon code to register for our upcoming digital stratosphere conference, which is in Denver, October 4th, 5th, and 6th. And you can register at stratosphere2023.com. And uh, while we're on it, just in case someone isn't here at the end of the episode, Kyler, what is the, the promo code to register for uh, the discounted rate for our listeners? Ooh, sneak peek. I like it. Um, the promo code is Stratosphere20, and that will get you 20% off um, any ticket that you'd like. So we have two different options. We have a day pass, and then we have a VIP ticket that gives you full access um, to exclusive interviews and content with Eric. Yeah, you get to meet Kyler and I, you get to meet a lot of people from third stage, as well as a lot of speakers are not from third stage. We have a, a really diverse group of speakers, a very cool group of speakers that we're continuously adding to. You can actually go to stratosphere2023.com and you can see all the speakers that are going to be there as of right now, although that list will grow over time. You can also see the agenda. You can use that promo code to get the discounted rate and uh, you can join me there uh, in October. And there will also be a... Um, at the event, there will also be a 80s cover band. So if you like 80s music, if you grew up in the 80s like I did, or if you just like 80s music, you will get to enjoy some live entertainment as well with us for uh, that Thursday evening at the, at the conference. And one other thing I'll promote while we're at it, because it, it just came out this week, uh, The Final Countdown is my new book uh, available on Amazon. You can get a paper copy book, you can get a hard copy book, you can get the electronic copy all on Amazon. Um, you can scan the QR code on the screen we'll put in front of you here, or just go to the final and it'll take you to the Amazon page where you can buy uh, the Kindle the electronic version. Even if you don't have a Kindle device, you can still uh, read it on a Kindle app on your device, whatever device you're using. Um, you can uh, buy that at the final You can also go to amazon.com and just search my name and you'll find it there. So the final just came out this last week. So be sure to check it out. I'm excited for it and I hope you all enjoy it. It's a technology agnostic overview of digital strategy and meant to give you sort of a playbook or a guide to define a digital strategy for your digital transformation. And it's a great learning tool for those of you that might be students as well and just trying to learn about the industry. So uh, check that out. And uh, 
I guess before we uh, bring on our guests and get into hot topics and whatnot, Kyler, you've got some uh, questions from your question jar, I see. Well, thanks, Eric. Yeah. And big congratulations on the books. So today I kind of want to start the questions off with something a little bit different. Um, I want to share one of the quotes from your book that has been um, kind of one of the top picks when it comes to our beta readers um, and see if you can kind of explain why that's important to the thesis of the book. Um, so I'll also post these on our social media channel and we can get some um, conversations going around that specifically on LinkedIn and Instagram. If you don't follow us um, at Third Stage Consulting Group and then at Eric Kimberling are all the ways in which you can Find us. So let's start by doing that. Um, so one of the my favorite quotes personally from the book is the success or failure of a digital strategy can be rooted in the three pillars of digital transformation, people, process and technology. And that's kind of a, an overarching quote from the foreword of the book that gives us an opportunity to kind of explain why you wrote the book. Right. Yeah, and that was really the whole gist of the covering a topic as broad as digital strategy. You know, it was, it was difficult to sort of focus the book, but also be broad enough that it you know covers the different components or the different angles and dimensions and lenses that organizations need to think about digital transformation. Um, so that's really the reason why we wanted to make sure that when we talk about digital strategy, we weren't just talking about tech trends or emerging tech or specific vendors and things of that nature. We wanted to talk more more broadly about the technology components, of course, but also, uh, more importantly, the people in the process and the overall strategy components of digital transformation. Absolutely. Um, well, definitely highly recommend uh, the final countdown um, strategies to reach the third stage of digital, digital transformation. Um, excellent book. Really excited to hear your thoughts on it as well. Um, so congratulations, Eric. And then you also have a congratulations this week on 60,000 YouTube subscribers. Um, so big milestone week for you um, as well. So with that, um, let's get into some questions from those subscribers and that audience. If you haven't been with us on Ground Control before, we take all of the questions that are left on Third Stage or um, Eric's social media channels, including YouTube, for both um, channels. And we put them in the question jar and ask them to Eric live. So um, we're going to get into a few of these today. Um, so this is specifically on your best ERP systems for career growth and opportunity video on your YouTube channel. Um, and it says, why isn't Workday included on this list if it's in your top 10 ERP systems? That's a great, uh, great point. Great question. Um, and I think in that video in question, I cover five, if I remember correctly, I think I cover five software systems that are worth considering as you embark on a career in the ERP software industry and Workday was not included, not because I don't like Workday or because I don't think there's a good opportunity there, but simply because I think the other systems I talk about in that video have a brighter future. Um, I will say though, Workday was right on the cusp. I mean, I, I could um, make a strong argument for why Workday should have been on that list of systems you should consider. One of the biggest ones is that Workday is growing very quickly, um, almost too quickly in, in a good way, for potential career um, development, which is to say that there's not enough resources to keep up with demand for Workday right now. So there is a lot of opportunity there. Um, I didn't include Workday primarily. Uh, one of the big reasons I didn't include it is because I get a lot of flack, honestly, when I include Workday and I refer to Workday as an ERP system. A lot of people uh, attack that and say that is not an ERP system. It's an HR and a financial system. Okay, it, it is. That's true. But in my mind, there's enough uh, breadth of functionality there that a lot of companies do use it as an ERP system. Um, so that was part of it was just recognizing that it's not a full blown, a hundred percent pure ERP system, if you will. Um, but having said that, if you are interested in finance and or HR, those, if that's, if you either or both of those areas in terms of functional experience appeal to you, then Workday absolutely would be one you'd want to consider because they are strong and they focus on those two functional areas. And it's a, it's a vendor with a bright future for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if you want to know more about Workday specifically in talking about the top ERP systems conversation, um, we did just recently launch our top ERP systems for 2024, as well as pre-ordering our digital op enterprise operations report, which is our bigger kind of industry 
um, landscape report that we launch every single year. So you can actually uh, go to the link down here in the description, download that for free and pre-order our digital enterprise operations report. So definitely a, a good kind of conversation to talk about what is an ERP system and what are your specific needs? Because it really set, it really is kind of, it depends, right? As you um, often love to say, Eric. So as I love to say, I love to say it always, not just often, but all the time. It's, it's it always applies. Uh, so this is uh, specifically on some of your content around SAP failures um, and talking about kind of why SAP failures have been more um, predominant in the marketplace currently. So are companies moving to SAP S4 HANA likely to have some surprises with its functionality? Yes, it is. And, and uh, that's really the whole premise of the video is, is why are SAP projects failing? And um, it seemed to have hit a nerve because it's a, it's a video that's gone viral in a very short period already. Um, but it is, you know, part of the problem, and it's not just SAP. I think SAP um, is just more visible in the marketplace because it's a lot of bigger companies, higher profile companies that are trying to implement S4 HANA. And while there have been some successes, in the S4 HANA space, there have been a lot of failures. We've seen a lot of failures and even in our own client base, uh, clients that come to us and say, hey, we're struggling with our project, or in some cases we've canceled our entire project uh, involving S4 HANA. Let's you know hire third stage to help us figure out how to get it back on track or how to look at other options. Um, most of the time it's not, you know, th there are issues with, with maturity for sure. And that is something I talk about in the video that there's certain functional capabilities that have not translated at the same mature state as ECC and even R3. And there, on the other hand though, S4 HANA brings some new capabilities. So it's kind of a weird dichotomy where you're getting all these new advanced capabilities that ECC and R3 did not have, you know, with, with the cloud solution and with the analytics and, you know, some of the more advanced capabilities of S4 HANA, but then there's more fundamental basic stuff that it just doesn't do as well. And, and especially when you get into some of the you know, outside the core ERP, when you start to get into things like uh, manufacturing or advanced planning, demand forecasting, things like that, that's where a lot of that maturity is missing um, from from organizations. And a lot of organizations just assume because it's SAP and because they're familiar with ECC or R3 or whatever legacy SAP product, they assume that S4 HANA must surely have those same capabilities, if not better. And they they miss out on the fact that there's there's some stuff that's missing. And, and in three or five years from now, I imagine this whole discussion will be a moot point and it will be obsolete. But for right now, companies that are implementing S four hundred are finding that finding that out the hard way as they go through their implementations. Absolutely. Um, and you know, if you want more information on SAP S four hundred specifically, we do have an SAP guide um, as well on our thought leadership. It's also linked below in. Um, in the description, wherever you're getting this video podcast today. Uh, so you can, again, download that resource for free and kind of go through that. It's really, as Eric mentioned, a complex implementation. So you really want to make sure you take it piece by piece and understand all of the risks involved with that, because it does fail higher, as Eric mentioned, than other ERP systems, just simply because it's larger, more complex. And the stakes um, are higher too, you know, because it's, it's more money being spent on implementations and whatnot. So that's a big part of it too. Yeah, true. Absolutely. Great point. Um, and if you do have questions for Eric, you can leave them on his social media with Ask Eric, or you can leave it on um, our social media on Third Stage, even my own um, as well. We pull all of the questions and bring them here. We also always ask the audience to answer these questions in the comments as well, because we got a lot of great insight and feedback from all of our diverse audience members um, in the comments too. So definitely join that conversation. We invite you to do so. Uh, but I know we have some some hot topics to get through that are actually really interesting this week. So and relevant, I think, to this episode and this conversation. Um, so excited to unpack those in just a few minutes with you, Eric. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, look forward to future questions that the audience might have. And uh, we'll get into those hot topics here in just a moment. We're going to talk about the ugly truth behind bad at IT. And then we're also going to talk about three roles for driving digital success. And then stay tuned even after this next segment, because later in the show, after we get through these hot topics, we're going to have Kristen Valentine on the show. And she's from she's a vice president at Epicor Software. She's going to be on the show with me talking about an overview of ERP systems, just sort of a lay of the land, a high level flyover view of the different software vendors in the marketplace and things you should be considering as you evaluate potential ERP systems for your transformation. And then later in the show, after Kristen joins us, we are going to play you a mashup from past digital stratosphere conferences. 
which is an annual conference we host. It's a tech agnostic conference that provides all the uh, thought leadership and speakers that you'd ever want to have in one place to talk about digital transformation and all the things you need to know to make it successful. We're hosting our next one October 3rd. 4th, 5th, and 6th in Denver, Colorado, but we thought we'd be a good way to give you a, a flavor of what to expect by playing you a mashup from past episodes or past uh, conferences. And we're also going to share with you a discount code for registration uh, at a 20% discount. We'll do that as well later in the show. So stick around for that. We'll get to our hot topics here in just a moment. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. We'll stick around. We'll be right back. Just tell me what you've got. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 135. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. So be sure to check us out there. And uh, you've got a couple of hot topics for us here today, Kyler. What have you got in store for us? Yeah. So first, I want to talk about the ugly truth behind quote unquote, bad IT. Um, and this specific article talks about why bad IT kind of pervades in enterprise tech. Um, and I wanted to get your, your feedback on it. And the whole premise of this conversation is how hard it is to get rid of quote unquote, bad or less performing technology. Um, especially if you have a very legacy IT team. Um, and they talk about that a, a lot of times uh, legacy IT systems will have the current kind of shelf life of the IT manager and the biases that exist with what the IT, IT team likes to use versus what there's better opportunity for the business to use. And the evolution of technology kind of moving out of the IT department and becoming more business centric. Um, so wanted to get kind of your feedback on what you thought about the concept of bad IT in a legacy IT environment. Do you need to look at the biases of your IT department when, if you are a leader looking at um, building a competitive advantage through technology? Is there a risk when you have a very legacy IT department and biases that have utilized other systems in which they're comfortable with? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great point, and it's a source of resistance, and uh, it, it creates a lot of change management issues when you go to replace some of those systems. And it's not because there's not better technology out there, and it's not that the legacy technology is necessarily better than new potential technology, but it's because it's a it's a path of least resistance, right? I mean, if if you've if you're an IT person and you've maintained a certain system and you've built a competency around understanding that particular system, um, and you've your value to the organization is your intimate knowledge of that system that no one else has. Um, it doesn't matter how great the new technology is, that person is probably going to resist the change because now you're threatening their well-being or their perceived value to the organization. And so that's, that is something you just have to be aware of. I think a lot of times executives falsely assume that the IT guy or the IT gal or other business stakeholders are totally on board with new technology because they don't because they recognize how outdated or how obsolete the old technology is it might be true on the surface, but as you get below the, the tip of the iceberg and you start to talk about what the changes mean and how that system really is going to go away. And now you're going to have to learn a whole new skill set uh, and reprove or, or reestablish your value to the organization. Those are the types of fears that cause resistance, resistance to change. And that resistance to change is not coming from a bad place. It's typically coming from a good place, but it, it manifests itself in a way that can be 
negative in, in an organization. So what you're saying and what you're describing is absolutely a very real phenomenon that, that uh, organizations need to be aware of. Absolutely. Definitely um, something to consider. And it's certainly not at the bad intentions. Um, as we often say, a lot of resistance or the majority of resistance is unintentional, which is about a comfort level. It's very similar to you know driving a car or riding a bike. You prefer the ones that you're comfortable on, even though you might have faster, more efficient models. Um, it just comes with a learning curve. Um, so speaking of learning curve, I want to I want to talk through these uh, three key roles for driving digital success. And this is actually from CIO Magazine. And I think this is interesting. The reason I say it's from CIO Magazine is it talks about the CIO's job of closing those execution gaps in digital strategies or digital transformation strategies. Um, and mostly they report into the board, which a lot of times we can find that the board of directors um, aren't exactly digital savvy or don't understand the overall execution um, implementation planning. So within this study, they found that only 35% of board of directors believe that their organizations are on track for delivering digital transformation objectives. Um, and another study of 4,000 global organizations found that only 44% had high digital maturity. And the reason I want to share those is there's kind of three key roles that they talk about in this study that that really will get you there. Um, and so agents of change is a big one. We talk a lot about that in not only our delivery work, but in our thought leadership. Um, and then also they talk about agile PMOs and you can go agile waterfall, however you wanna look at that. But in this study, they mean flexible PMOs um, in execution digital strategies. So we talk a lot about that. Um, and then this, the third one I actually wanted to share with you because we don't talk a ton about this one. And I think it's an interesting topic and it's called domain experts, so specialized standard bearers. So the um, the product leaders and the delivery leaders, and these look like these domain experts such as solution architects or user enterprise specialists, Six Sigma analysts, information security leaders, data architects, um, and they need to really go into evolving self-organizing standards when it comes to how they're actually gonna execute and build the digital transformation roles. So wanted to share kind of these specific areas in which you need to have those areas of expertise within your overall core team that might be led by your PMO, but wanted to get kind of your feedback on highlighting that as really the third main pillar to a successful digital transformation team. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting hearing that. I hadn't heard that perspective before that seen that particular article, but I think that's... Uh... Yeah, those are great points. And, it, and I think it's important to, um, you know, look at the different roles that are required and the different competencies that are required. I think that's a more than anything, the takeaway that I have is that it's not one certain skill set or one certain role that makes or breaks a project. It's the way you combine all that and make sure you address, you know, more holistically all the different pieces and components that need to go into it. So I, I think it's a uh, well said, and that sounds like a pretty interesting article for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's one of those things where that might be right for one organization, but you have to find the unique domain experts for your organization. I think that's the overall thesis of that. And that's why having a third party that's non-biased, that's completely independent and is, is focused on your goals is so important because identifying those experts when you're going through an internal process can be really complex and difficult, but they are critical to being able to be successful in an uphill battle of achieving a digital transformation success in it and getting that optimal business value. Yeah. And, and just getting, you know, making sure you don't have the blind spots either and make sure you've got that, like you said, the domain experience and the using that input. That's, that's, that's a critical part of a transformation for sure. Well, good. Well, thank you for um, kind of taking us through these hot topics. Each week we do go through hot topics here on Ground Control. If you do have hot topics you want us to cover, you can pop them in the comments here and I will source some research around them, but we love to engage our audience and, and would love to hear from you as well. So thank you to the audience. Thank you to you, Eric, on this trending um, topic discussion. Definitely always important to stay on top of how to make us successful. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for bringing up these hot topics. They're, they're, uh, I always learn a lot in the segment of the show, so I uh, hope, hope the audience did as well. Um, we're going to keep learning, though. We're going to keep rolling with the lessons in the discussion here. Uh, we are going to have uh, Kristen Valentine on the show to talk about an overview of ERP systems. We're going to provide you sort of the lay of the land, the 20,000-foot flyover 
of the ERP software industry. And then we're also going to get into later in the show, uh, a mashup of past digital stratosphere conferences. And that is a conference we are going to host in person, live in person, October 4th through the 6th in Denver, Colorado. But we thought in the meantime, we'd give you a flavor of what to expect by playing you a mashup of past uh, clips from past stratosphere conferences. So we'll get to those two segments when we come back. But first, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground. Hi, this is Eric Kimberling, your host here on Transformation Ground Control. I want to personally invite you to our upcoming Stratosphere 2023 event. It's a conference that we host every year. It's a tech agnostic conference, features a number of independent technology agnostic speakers, both from third stage consulting, as well as from outside our company. We try to bring in the, the industry's brightest minds and the most objective minds to help you learn the things you need to know to make your transformation successful. We cover everything from digital strategy to software evaluation, to change management, to program management, to process improvement, data and architecture, migration, all that kind of stuff we're going to cover here in Digital Stratosphere. It's going to be October 4th, 5th, and 6th in Denver, Colorado. I'll be there. Kyler will be there, our co-host here on Transformation Ground Control, as well as others will be there. So be sure to check us out. We'll also have great opportunities for networking, for peer networking, as well as networking with speakers. We're also going to have great entertainment too. We'll have some happy hour networking events as well as live music from that 80s band, which is uh, my favorite cover band. They play all 80s stuff. Uh, so come enjoy that as well while you're while you're at it. It's all happening in Denver, October 4, 5, and 6. Uh, you can go to stratosphere2023.com to learn more about the event. Be sure to register by August 15th to get the early bird discounts, which is uh, fairly significant. Again, stratosphere2023.com. Learn more about it. Hope to see you there. And uh, in the meantime, hope you enjoy the rest of this episode of Transformation Ground Control. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 135. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham. You can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. Uh, we are excited for our next guest. First time guest on the show, uh, Kristen Valentine is a vice president at Epicor Software, uh, knows a lot about the space, not just because she works at Epicor Software, but even more importantly, she's worked at six other software vendors throughout the year. So we thought she'd be a great person to come on the show and talk about uh, just the lay of the land and kind of an overview of some of the leading software vendors in the marketplace. She's worked for a lot of the big names, most of the big names that you've heard of. Uh, she's been a part of in her uh, illustrious career. So uh, with all that being said, uh, Kristen, welcome to the show. Oh, it's my pleasure, Eric. Thanks. I look forward to this. Yeah, this will be fun. And um, you and I have known each other for several years now, and uh, even predating your current role. You've worked at a lot of different software companies. We're going to get to that in just a moment as far as sort of your background. But maybe just to start, tell us a little bit about you know what you do at Epicor and, and also tell us a little bit about what, what brought you to Epicor. What did you do before you were at Epicor? Well, as you know, what I did before is is probably the most unique and list and actually probably be shorter to talk about what I didn't do before Epicor, but we can get to that in just a minute. Um, but I, I head up the Strategic Alliance and Influencer Program here at Epicor. Um, it's part of our overall transformation. Pretty exciting to be part of all of this, especially at this point in my career. Uh, and so I report directly to uh, President Lisa Pope, as you know, who has been on other ground controls. And uh, I'm thrilled to be here um, today talking to everybody who's part of the third stage community. Absolutely. And, and glad to have you here. And uh, you, you have a, a pretty unique uh, background. And part of the reason why I thought you'd be great to have on the show, and not only have you and I just known each other in your various roles over the years at different companies, but you just have sort of a unique background of having worked for several different software companies. Can you give us a sort of a flavor of, I know you said it might be easier to talk about the ones you haven't worked for, but maybe hit some <laughs> of the highlights of the ones you have worked for to help us understand. Yeah, I think, and thank you for pointing that out because I really do think it makes this kind of role very, very kind of cumulative, if you will. But yes, Epicor is my seventh ERP vendor. And uh, I, I wish I had money on that to challenge <laughs> one other person. Have they ever worked for seven? But they, they include the ones that we all know about, SAP, Oracle, Infor, but also QAD and CISPRO. And then there was an older version, um, you know, that is an older application that's now owned by Infor Bond. Um, for those of you who go a few years back, just a few. Yeah. Right. But. 
and bond is still around. We still uh, deal with companies that are, that are still uh, using bond. Most of them are trying to move away from it, but uh, a lot of them are still using it. Yeah. Um, it's a pretty unique background um, in terms of the, you know, these different vendors you've worked for. And you've worked with the big guys, the smaller guys, the guys in between and a uh, pretty unique perspective. Um, what do you, you know, when you look at these um different well actually before i ask that question sorry let me back up a little bit yeah um how did you get in i'm just curious more than anything how did you end up in the space like if we go back before you were working for any of these vendors how did you end up in the erp software space i always love to ask that question because i myself just sort of stumbled into it so i'm curious how you got into it well i i like you uh you know stumbled into it as well and i want to say actually um for any of those who who are listening who might be on the up and coming of their opportunity of their careers you know what opportunity presents itself in some strange looking, you know, clothes, situations, even opportunities. And so um, I heard Ashton Kutcher say opportunity often looks a lot like hard work. Um, and, and so as much as, you know, you don't wake up one day and you're here, um, it's, it's a question of being open-minded, talking to people, figuring out and, and really fundamentally think, you know, beginning and ending every day that somebody's got value and our job is to listen to that. So I was very, very fortunate in my career. I met somebody, um, who introduced me to a CFO and I think everybody was being nice. Um, <laughs> but when they made the mistake of saying, please call back, you know, please touch base with us every two weeks. They didn't realize I did for nine months. <laughs> right. <until> they... <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> when an opportunity came up, that's how I got into technology. And, you know, for, for women who are on the line too, it's really important to note that um, at that time, uh, there were people who were very well intended and had my best interests at heart, uh, but were very gentle in saying, you know, software is hard. Kristen, it's hard. <laughs> and what I want everyone to encourage is, is no, it's not. <laughs> if, right. you know, if you have a fundamental interest in business and you are smart enough to follow the money, um, and what I mean by that is money is driving. I mean, this is a business, not a hobby, not a charity. It's it's a business. And if you follow the money and look at the orientations of money, you can grasp almost any concept in business um, most notably in technology, because it's all we're all writing software so companies compete more effectively, um, are are have much more customer loyalty, are profitable. I mean, think about all of those pieces tied right back down to the money. So right. never uh, if you think you can do it, you know, keep an open mind, listen and you're probably a lot smarter than your peers. Never give your peers more credit than they deserve. Yes. Great, great, uh, great line and great set of advice there. Um, just real quickly, before I get to my other questions here, I want to uh, turn to the audience and just look at where, where people are joining from today. Um, as I mentioned, there's typically people all over the world that join these discussions and today is no different. We have people uh, from Denver, Colorado, London, Singapore, Nashville, Tennessee, Dubai, uh, Southwest Missouri, uh, U.S., Western Colorado, Denver, Birmingham, UK, Ecuador, LA, Italy, India, Canada, Egypt, Vietnam, UK again, a, a few people from UK. So thank you all for joining from all over the world, especially for those of you joining at odd times of, of day and night. Um, appreciate you joining here today. And any questions you have about the ERP software industry, different software vendors, how they compare, how you might evaluate potential vendors, anything like that that you have questions about, please feel free to drop it in the chat here. Um, and in fact, um, I'm, before I get into my questions, too, one thing I want to want to point out. Um, first of all, I'll caveat this by saying Third Stage is independent. We are not affiliated with Epicor, and we're also not affiliated with any software vendors. But we do every year put out a top ten ranking of the top ten ERP systems, and we just released. We actually today is the first day it's available, um, and we wanted to make sure we had it in time for this discussion. But every uh, year we do the top 10 ranking of the top 10 ERP systems. I'm going to put a QR code up on the screen here in front of you up, up the top left. Uh, if you scan that QR code, you can download um, the top 10 ERP systems for 2024. And you can also pre-register to receive our 2024 uh, digital enterprise operations report, which is sort of an overview of the industry, comparison of different software vendors, et cetera. So be sure to download that. And the reason I'm bringing that up as part of this conversation is Epicor is in our top 10 list for the first time. They're at number five this year in our top 10 ranking. So 
when you download that, you will see that Epicor is number five and you can, um, you can read and com see how it compares to other systems. Um, and that's really the gist of today's conversation too, is really taking your unique perspective, uh, Kristen, and, and trying to understand um, what Epicor is doing in the market and, and as well as how, you know, how it compares to other technologies that are, that are out there since you've worked for a lot of them. Um, but what are, when you look at these seven different software vendors you've worked at and worked with over the years, what are, what are some of the biggest differences you see among these different products? I mean, in, in some ways, you know, I've heard people say in the industry, like, oh, we, all ERP software is pretty much the same. They just have a different, you know, front end, you GUI or whatever, but they all kind of do the same thing, which I don't think you believe that's true. I don't believe that's true, but how would you, how would you summarize just some, some of the big differences between different systems in the marketplace in general? Well, you know, so ERP is commoditizing. Let's just call a spade a spade. And so to a certain extent, there's a kind of a checklist of do you do these functions? Absolutely. But I think it's really important to look at um, the, the, the company itself of, um, you know, the software author, where they're headquartered, um, because all of that flows into what that, what that software is. So at the end of the day, um, having been with so many, I've picked up all these beautiful nuggets along the lines, as well as best practices. And if you always keep in mind that software is, is business process expressed in technology, mm. right? It is how people think in technology. So if you look at how um, an SAP goes to market and how they see themselves and also how the software is written, all of that about their culture, their expectations flows right into the software um, as well as, so you look at, you can look at the culture of the, of, you know, where the company's headquartered, but also too, did they start with financials first or vertical first? Those are two things that are very, very defining. And it's not to say that people can't be tremendously successful, but understanding those inherent differences. I've worked for, um, you know, or worked closely with companies that were based in Israel, South Africa, obviously with CISPRO, right? The way they go to market, you know, we all think, hey, software, software, software. Nope, entirely different. Australia. Um, and then, you know, is with Bond too, um, Bond was very, very, I was part of the aerospace and defense practice, which was very internationally driven. Um, so, you know, those kinds of things really do ferret out in, fine, you know, making sure that either if you're looking to bet your business on, you know, ERP, or you're looking to bet your career on ERP, those are important criteria to take into account so that you can quickly understand what the intended value is and where you're going to gain from it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, uh, certainly, you know, I like your, your phrase that, um, ERP is, is what'd you say process it, their business processes enabled by technology Press and technology. Yep. Got it. I love that. It's a, it's a great, a great saying. Um, so what are, when you look at the, the software, the ERP software space in general, over the, the years that you and I have both been in this space, yeah. Um, what are some of the biggest changes you've seen in the industry in general? You know, how, how has ERP software evolved? What are the biggest changes that you've seen or that you're most excited about it in recent years? I, I actually, candidly, finally, ERP is offering the promise of ERP. Um, for, for some of you, I hope, you know, you're, you're, you have a beach with an, with, um, you know, a, a drink with an umbrella in your sights. But for some of you, you've been entering data into these systems for 40, sometimes 50 years, and then have these excruciating jobs of getting it out into anything meaningful. And now, and, and you know, even my ERP brethren are going to be like, wait, oh, I'm a little uncomfortable about that. But now ERP and its focus is shifting to being, if you look at um, the outcome, is, is the car. And it's all about data. It's the car is going to take you where you want to want to go. And data becomes that car. It is data so that you can be predictive, prescriptive, proactive. It, the data thing is so exciting. And now the tools are such that all of this stuff you've been putting into your ERP can actually be harnessed. And all of that now fuels that data car, so to speak, to get you where you want to go. 
you know, we've all seen incredibly manual, tedious processes. And so much of that is going to go away so that we can really feel like we have a meaning, you know, meaningful impact or we can compete more effectively or we can just get to market faster. Oh, and surprise, smarter. Right. We're here with Kristen Valentine, the vice president at Epicor Software. We're talking about an overview of ERP systems in the marketplace. We've got a lot more to cover, but first, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. Interested in working for a company that truly values your unique skills and experience? Here at Third Stage, we don't hire based on resumes alone. We look at the full candidate, experience, and willingness to provide excellent service for our clients. Within a technology independent and agnostic consulting firm, you have the opportunity to learn across industries with a diverse group of clients. Our consultants also have the opportunity to diversify their portfolio and learn across technology systems. If you're interested in joining a high growth entrepreneurial organization, please reach out to us at work at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 135. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyla Cheatham, and we're here with Kristen Valentine talking about an overview of ERP software and the ERP system market. Let's jump back into the conversation. And especially now when you look at some of the tools that a lot of the software vendors have, like artificial intelligence and analytical tools, I mean, they've always had reporting, so your basic reporting, but now you've got... um, AI and machine learning and analytics and things like that, that can actually make use of all this data that we've all been hoarding as organizations for decades, you know? And so I I think that's one of the benefits of ERP software now. Oh, it's, it's tremendous. And, you know, it, it, back to that point about, um, you know, kind of how, how that data is structured. And again, you know, ERP is business process expression technology. I often say, you know, what's simpler in your home than socks, there are four people in my home and there are four different or sock drawer organizations. And it, you know, if you think about it, because that is literally how people think based on their needs, their requirements, their preferences, there's, and if you think about software as architected that way, um, so that it's how somebody's thought process those, or how often have you gone into somebody's kitchen and like, where the hell do you keep the glasses? Well, that's again, <laughs> I can't find a coffee cup. <laughs> right. um, but my point being is it's how people think that's expressed in technology and data then takes that. So all that information is, is organized relative to your company, how you think, how your software vendor thinks or your software author thinks. But now data then takes that and says, okay, what do you want to do with it? Right. And, and, and really takes it to that next level. And it becomes actually more about being customer centric um, because you, you can communicate with your customer better. Um, you're even when I say customer centricity, I actually expand the concept over and above competing for customers, but competing for talent, um, right. you know, making it easier to use, makes people feel more comfortable, more effective and also see a bigger career trajectory when they really feel like data allows you to be much more meaningful faster, um, as opposed to the na, 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 na. (laughs) I'm going to go sit at my desk with my stack of papers and. (laughs) Right. Go enter it into a spreadsheet and manipulate it. And then I'll have hopefully the right answer of what I'm looking for. In about six or eight weeks. Right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) When the market's already passed. (laughs) Right. The data is obsolete at that point, but at least I got the report done. (laughs) Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, this is a good segue, this question here, uh, a good segue from something you just said, Kristen, and this is from Kyler on LinkedIn. It says, Kristen, interested to hear your perspective on the shift from the fit our requirements or leave approach, and that's in quotes, to quote unquote, customer centric focus in the ERP vendor marketing place. What are, what are your thoughts? And you started to talk about a little bit about customer centricity, and I know that's a big uh, strategic focus for Epicor um, at the moment, but what, what can you say about that? Well, you know, I I originally got tasked um, by Lisa Pope to say, make sense out of digital transformation. Talk about like an incredibly overused term and what and can be very, very innocuous. 
And as you know, and we've all learned from the Ground Control podcast, it, it really kind of falls under operational efficiencies, getting to the cloud, data centric, but customer centricity. And, and I, I talk about that specifically because, you know, Epicor has got a commitment to be very, compo you know, composable software, right? Mm -hmm. So that you can create what works, the best business blueprint for your success. Um, but also, I was just talking to Vaya Bob, um, our, our, our chief technology product officer, and he said, you know, and make software people want to use. What a concept. <laughs> right. One of the companies that I did work for and then on the other side of it used. Um, it took me six hours to enter in a single purchase order. Six hmm. hours. For one single PO? One single PO. Wow. It was, yeah. Um, and the good news is all the post office were safe. I, I didn't take out a point. <laughs> right. yeah, I, I didn't end up on the news after I got it done. <laughs> right. But, you know, you think about software that people want to use and can use. Um, this company had very large deals and didn't, you know, so that you weren't entering in a part purchase order all the time, nor did they have huge staff to be able to have this whole staff ready and waiting to enter an PO. But think about that. Think about what that means from the whole value chain, right? Um, that customer is their order right when, when it, the specific is so rigid and so finite. Um, you know, are you, can you be that fluid and dynamic to your customers? Oh, by the way, can you just interact with them in a meaningful way so that they're, um, they're getting timely updates. And so one, you can take their response, but also two, back to the workforce and the, in the, and the, if you will, it's kind of corny, the vibe you bring to the market, right? Are you a can do collaborative partner with your customers when, as I mentioned, you're ready to throw your laptop across the window. The game right. The room. Right. Well, and this, this is uh, an interesting comment from Gary on YouTube. Gary says, don't let bad processes drive the technology though. And that's sort of what you're saying is, you know, don't, don't, don't take a bad process and an efficient process and then hope that your new technology can just automate that. Oh. Really want to rethink how you, how you approach your business. Right. Or Gary, let me just say, don't put lipstick on a pig. Um, right. <laughs> you know, so yeah, you really do need to think about those processes and do they work, but also too, that makes the point about this was a $60 million company should not have had, um, you know, I won't say which one of the ones, but the first couple that I always call out shouldn't have had it just too heavy a, a product for a $60 million company. Now that company wanted to go public. So of course they purchased, um, you know, it, um, the software so that they could, you know, kind of create their profile for, you know, their to go get a much more effective, you know, um, offering. But, you know, that was a little too ahead of the curve and the software was just too big and too heavy and they didn't have the infrastructure. But, you know, we also know too, and I think Gary makes a great point. We've all heard the story. I think Eric, if I tortured you with this, you know, please let me know, but you know, about the new bride who makes her, um, her husband um the celebratory meal of a roast and she immediately lops the end off right you've heard this story i have not i have not or if i have i don't remember where where we're going with it so i'm curious well, to see it makes <laughs> it makes gary's point in that the new you know and and you know immediately the the husband is is quite distressed because he, the end is his best his favorite part and i'll make this a lot it's you know certainly i can i can milk a joke but this one for you guys i'll try to make it quick the long and the short of it is he you know great meal goes to the mother uh in law and says you know i love love your daughter great it was so touched by this celebratory meal but why does she lump you know lop the end off of the roast before she makes it oh you don't understand it came from my mother it's handed down traditions we always used it for you know holidays and big events and it's a time-honored tradition goes to the grandmother and says, you know, well, thank you very much. I love your daughter. It was great. But then goes to the grandmother and says, you know, great meal, loved it, et cetera. But I don't understand why you cut the end of the roast off when that's my favorite part. And the grandmother says, because my pants are too small. <laughs> it's very fitting. I mean, it's, well, pardon that that was not an intentional pun, but it's, it's oh, yeah. for, for, nice <laughs> pun. Yeah. <laughs> but for this industry, that's very fitting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it needs to, uh, you, you don't want to force fit. Is, is that the lesson here? You don't want to force fit a, a process into, into technology and vice versa? Well, and also question, 
why are we doing these things this way? Just because you've always done them this way does not necessarily mean you should be doing them going forward. And it, it's not to say that, you know, you're contrarian, but I think it's really healthy to question um, and say, it, does this matter? Is this, you know, is it relevant? And also, you know, question your market. Um, if you have relationships with your customers to say, how does this fit? Is this working for you? But at the same time, also, you know, and many of us probably don't want to hear it, but also ask your, you know, your up and coming workforce. It, how did this feel? Does this make sense? Um, I had the wonderful uh, opportunity of calling on a contract manufacturer in in, um, uh, in Reno, which we know is a huge growth area. Mm. And every, the guy who did the scheduling came in at 4 a.m., posted the schedule. So when they came in at 7, all the workers gathered around the pole that it was taped on. This is true. At 7, 9, after lunch and again at two based on the deliveries that came in that day. Mm. And you're thinking to yourself, just think about the time that's taken. Yes. Yes. The scheduling guy was brilliant. Yes. That is how the way they did it. But yes, also too, what should have taken, a, you know, mm, two to five minutes of what, where are my jobs and what can I work on was turning into two and a half hours of coffee clatching because everybody was gathering around and, and you look at like, mm, OK, yep, the schedule's good and everybody knows what they need to do. But are we getting, you know, are we getting the kind of productivity that allows us to take more jobs or to deliver jobs faster? Um, because we do we just keep. Well, that's how we always do it. And candidly, in that situation, the workers like the poll. <laughs> they liked yeah. gathering around and chatting. So there was also that change that has, which it's just this kind of question. I mean, that's an obvious, this doesn't seem terribly efficient, but you can also see where there's going to be resistance to change. So when you do challenge, you know, why we are doing this all the way, you know, also embrace that, you know, most people don't wake up and saying, I need to be different today. Um, and so, you know, you really need to assess the change um, you know, the aptitude for change, the digestibility for change or consumption, I should say. Yeah. And it, it's funny you say that because when, as you were telling that story, the first thing I thought about was the scheduling guy and the scheduling guy is probably going to be the first one to resist that change because, you know, you, it's, it's a heroic sort of a job, right? He's despite all these limitations of data and systems and processes and manual stuff, he or she is now making still making it happen. And so that those heroics go away if you start to automate that person's process. So you have to think about it from a change perspective too, and not, not assume necessarily that the scheduling guy is going to love it because it's going to make his job easier. He's not going to love it because now he's going to question his value to the organization. And so it might be best for the organization, but you know, that's, that's sort of the change management nuance that a lot of organizations overlook. Yeah, no, that's absolutely, absolutely critical. And whether that's a scheduling guy or a reporting guy or somebody, you know, or, you know, who's heading up your shop floor, um, even facilities, there is always going to be a certain resistance to change. And so it's important to frame that questioning in a respect based way um, that actually focuses on the outcome, not necessarily the people doing it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. We're here with Kristen Valentine, the vice president at Epicor Software. We're talking about an overview of ERP systems in the marketplace. We've got a lot more to cover, but first we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. Are you looking to stay ahead of the curve in the ever-changing landscape of digital transformation? Then you need our newly released 2023 Digital Transformation Report. This comprehensive report covers the latest trends, technologies, and strategies to ensure your digital transformation is optimized for success. The 2023 Digital Transformation Report is packed full of proven methodologies and insights from experts in the independent digital transformation field. You'll also receive practical insights on how to implement digital transformation strategies within your unique organization. This free report is available for download on our website at thirdstage-consulting.com under our thought leadership section. Hello, 
Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 135. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyla Cheatham, and we're here with Kristen Valentine talking about an overview of ERP software and the ERP system market. Let's jump back into the conversation. YouTube says, I am Sneehit, an MBA student from India. Your weekly sessions are incredibly informative and enlightening. So thank you for that. That's I love hearing that sort of feedback. So I'm glad you listen often and find this info helpful. And I hope you continue to do so. Um, Kyler, just to close a loop on this, Kyler does come back to the sock uh, analogy. And she feels like socks are a complex issue in her household. So um, <laughs> you really hit a nerve there with the, the sock analogy um, there. But Wait. <laughs> Wait, Kyler, until you've got, you know, pro, you know, kids on sports teams, then your the whole sock thing really expands. Yeah. Uh, how old are your kids, Kristen? <laughs> uh, mine are 22. I have twins. Uh, oh, but okay. yeah, but, you know, especially on varsity teams, you know, then you've got, you know, certain colors. I, I've never seen, I did not know there's a whole fashion choice in your tube socks. Yes. I don't even really call them tube socks anymore. Uh, but you know, there's probably a cooler name than that, that you and I are not privy to, but, uh, <laughs> I've got two teenage well, boys that are in sports. So I, I feel really bad for my wife who has to deal with the sock situation in our household. So <laughs> I, I do not typically deal with that. <laughs> now here's a, here's a question, um, that I want to come, come to, cause it's, it's about a specific vendor. Um, but I think it's a general, it was, we could generalize this question a little bit too. This is from, from a handle named vapor trails on YouTube. Um, and this user says, I know that for us, Microsoft Dynamics has all the tools we need, but it has a steep learning curve and the cost to get someone to help us with it is too high for our budget. So I guess just to maybe frame that into a question about ERP systems in general and the things you should think about as you evaluate potential vendors, you know, how important is that user interface and that user experience? I know you've, you've talked a bit about customer experience. Um, what about the user experience and, and how are you guys addressing that or how do you think about that at Epicor? Well, Vapor Trails, I want to thank you very, very much for that question because, um, you know, back, I, I know I'm probably banging this drum just a little too loud, but again, back to customer centricity, um, because ERP has become kind of commoditized, if you will, the, the shift of quote unquote power is moving to you, is moving to you as the customer to say, I want and what I need. And to Eric's point, that is about the UI, that is about whether the footprint is light um, and you know their fast time to benefit and are the solutions composable. And so when you, you know, talk about um, those are obviously, I just articulated some of um, our key themes for the year. And what we mean by, again, I'll, I'll mention again, but composable means that, that you're empowered to create the best business blueprint for your success. And again, that you need to, no different than taking a look at the software publishers, you know, kind of profile, look at your own profile too. Do we have the staff? What's our, what is the age of our workforce? Um, and so, you know, in terms of, you know, consuming new technologies, you know, that's where you're going to get things like the UI. Um, you know, as crazy as it sounds, we all still heard of the green screen people, but trust me, their data entry is off the charts fast. Whoever thinks of this, right? But in the other point, there's a whole other community. If they're not tapping, swiping, and pinching, um, they literally are struggling to use technology. So that's your point about the UI is take a good hard look at your company relative to um, you know, how consumable, how usable do people want to use that software? Because they, in the industry, people um, equate application efficacy with the UI experience. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a little, it is window dressing. So it doesn't necessarily mean that, but if they're not, but at the end of the day, if they're not going to use it because they don't like it, then you're still not getting the value out of your software. And you can kind of move through the value chain relative to all of those pieces in terms of composable because, um, you know, again, when technology providers were kind of more in control, um, and that really is, I think, the most fundamental change. And I hate to say it, talk about the new normal, but let's call a spade a spade. The, where we are today is never going to go back to where we were three years ago. It's just not. Um, technology and options and, and, and a service-oriented culture have changed literally our days 
the way we literally live our lives and that's never going to go backwards. And so when you, when you think about that relative to, again, you know, the, the power of choice has shifted over you to you all customers, where do you want to invest? Do you want to continue to invest? invest in software. That's one of the things that we think about. Um, I love being at Epicor because Epicor has a fast time to benefit commitment. Um, it's not the traditional one to four of licenses to software. And, you know, again, going back to that one vendor that I actually worked for and used, um, you know, the mantra was, yippee, we've got a new customer. I've got a 10 year services trajectory. Wait, what? Okay, so I have this whole ecosystem that's looking forward to um, living off of me, you know, um, and, and I can't use that same funds to invest in my new product or buy my competitor to grow my, my market space or actually get better or um, expand my product line or hire more salespeople so we can just sell more. So, you know, that's what I keep talking about. This shift over to you is to, okay, what are your priorities as a company? And what, you know, what of us, which one of us is going to be your partner saying, you know what, you've got this. We're here to support you in those choices and giving you options and whether it's budget or, you know, utilization of existing investments, like, you know, the ability to integrate to anything, you know, that's really where you want to look at is who's going to be my partner in creating that best business blueprint for your success. Cause you know, your market, you know what it requires. Um, you, you know what you need to do and there's uniquenesses to you that need to be retained because that is your customer value proposition. That's your profit margin. That's your difference in when you go to market. Um, right. one, one of the best practices that I got from, um, which I thought was just brilliant, but I've learned little great nuggets throughout all of them. Um, but QED used to say a $2 billion manufacturer has the, you know, food manufacturer has the exact same needs as a $2 million manufacturer. And because those $2 million food manufacturers are now fast and coming and want to be purchased or whatnot, um, everybody's got to compete. And who's going to be your partner in competing? Right. Right. Does that answer your question? It answers it for me, but it wasn't my question. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so we'll have to let the, I forgot. Did not, else, did we answer your question? <laughs> yeah. Let us know if we did not answer your question or if we have a follow-up to, uh, to that. But I thought it was a great, that's a great, um, great response in my opinion. Um, I have, a, I have a question that's actually going to lead into a couple other questions from the audience, but I'll ask maybe a more uh, broad question. But first, before I do that, um, in addition to our top 10 ERP systems that is right, my camera's backwards, so I have to figure out which way I'm pointing here. But right here, there's a QR code on the screen. Uh, if you scan that, you can get our top 10 ERP systems, and you'll see um, how Epicor ranks to other systems in the market. Uh, spoiler alert, they're number five on the list in case you missed the beginning where I said that. Um, the other thing I want to invite you to, I'm really excited about this. This is a, a shameless self-promotion here, Kristen, so bear with me, although I'm going to give you credit for this too. Um, I, my new book is called The Final Countdown, and I just got these hard copies yesterday. It still has the watermark on it because it's the advanced copy. Um, it's going to be available on paperback and hard uh, copy um, starting Saturday on Amazon. But in the meantime, you can buy it now, um, the electronic, the Kindle copy on Amazon, which you don't have to have a Kindle device. You can watch it on any device, but uh, you can order the electronic copy on Amazon. And I'm going to put the link up here uh, for you in just a second, but I'm excited about that. It's my first book um, that's uh, available worldwide. So be sure to um, check that out. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. And, and the reason I'm going to give you credit is because all I did in this book was summarize what I've learned over 25 years of being in the industry. And I've just learned it from people like you. So all I'm really doing is uh, conveying back to in a book uh, of what. Um, what I've learned from people like you. So really we should have Kristen Valentine as a co-author on this. So I, I wonder if there's time to <laughs> maybe go back to press and we could add a little Chris, Eric Kimberling and Kristen Valentine and every other person that I've learned a ton of stuff from over the, over the years. So um, well, I often say I don't have an original idea. I'm just super smart at parroting back something I've learned from SAP, Oracle, QAD, Infor, CISPRO and Bond. So yes. Um, so. Yes. I'm, I'm uh, I, I feel the same way often. So, I'll leave that up here for a second. Um, if it goes away and you don't have time to scan it, or if you're having trouble with the QR code, you can also just go to thefinalcountdown.com and that'll take you directly to the page where you can 
read about it, uh, read more about the book itself. And also um, you can order it on there as well. So go to thefinalcountdown.com or you can just scan the QR code here in front of you. However, I am going to hide it because it is covering Kristen's face and I don't want to cover Kristen's <laughs> face uh, throughout this conversation. So I so, have the uh, voice for radio. I have the face for radio. Yeah. That's what, that's what I would say about myself. <laughs> so it's funny. Uh, we're, we're thinking like, although I think I have more of a face for radio definitely than, than you do. Um, but we, we, I really, I, I can't wait to read it. It's really, um, and that's a question that's so often asked is what are you reading now? And, and, you know, obviously, yes, Eric and I have known each other from a different, you know, prior to Epicor, we met what, 10 years ago. Probably. Um, yeah. Was that at, about yeah. At a, at a competing vendor. And that's very, very notable. And you'd all rec recognize the name, but I really do encourage you to read to get that glean because, you know, what you're going to realize again, if we keep going back to ERP is, is business process express and software, you're going to see that compare contrast in a really effective way to say, what's going to fit for my company um, in terms of, again, adoption, uh, expectation, cycles, si you know, in, amount of investment. Um, you know, let's face it. We all don't need a Lamborghini to go to the grocery store, right? And um, but in the same respect, um, you know, based on your brand, uh, we sure as hell don't necessarily want to be um, maybe in a Ford Focus if we have to right. drop our kids off at school. So you know what I mean, there's these, you know, so it's both are great, both are cars, both will get to where you want to go, but which is the right one for you? And that's right. kind of where. Right. Absolutely. And, and actually, that's a great that's a perfect segue into the question I was going to ask you next. That's also sort of a gateway question into a bunch of audience questions that are piling on here. Uh, but one of the questions that that I had for you, Kristen, is how do you if we shift gears here and talk more specifically about Epicor and where Epicor fits in the market, how it compares to other software vendors? How does it how do, how do you see Epicor fitting in the ERP software landscape overall? Um, that's actually one of the reasons I'm here, first and foremost. Um, I love the fact that our executive leadership team is literally best in class. If you look at the backgrounds, it's really some inspiring, exciting um, experiences and companies that they're bringing to the to the leadership team, the vision, the direction of Epicor. But the other thing that's really different, and especially for those of you who are up and coming um, in your careers, I, I worked with a co-worker co -worker who used to refer to, and because and, I've obviously I've spent a lot of time in billion dollar companies, and they would talk about the UPAMs. I always love that expression, you know, the unknown people above me, right? Where, you know, the CEO is a picture you see on, you know, either a magazine or in the financial report, but who, who the God, you know, who the heck do we even know who these people are? Right. And not only so in contrast to those, um, you know, and, and, you know, you're even nervous a little bit if you happen to be in the elevator with them like zoinks, um, you know, those kinds of things where Epicor's executive leadership team is the most accessible um, and and but accessible in such a great way. They're they you know we actually are running this billion dollar best business practice series where we just have our executives talk about kind of what keeps them up at night and when i say what keeps them up at night right what 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 really excites them about their jobs where do they see they're going to make an impact where do they want to take their role and that's across the company um and so not only so you've got best in class experience but you also have this very accessible you know, we all put our shoes on the exact same way attitude of ask the question. And Eric, you've probably actually seen some of that, um, uh, you know, in terms of your interactions with them. There's really not a lot of pomp and circumstance. There's a very accessible, you know, how can I help attitude and where can I help? So so one, I, I you know, you hear about this consistently, but people um, come to companies, but they leave for bosses. And mm -hmm. so I think first and foremost, it is the executive leadership team, but that threads all the way through to the vision. Again, going back to you as the customer, it's awesome to be in a product, you know, be with a company that understands that, you know what, fast time to benefit is what you need. Um, sure, uh, love to take your money for the next five to 10 years in terms of implementing this really big software, but you know what, 
I liked the thought of that we've worked together and you're more competitive for it. And right. that you, and that you were able to get benefits in year one. So the light footprint, fast time to benefit, those kinds of things are just simply fun. Epicor is very committed to integrate to anything and everything, you know, which again allows you to reuse your existing investments because we all have a pet application that we either that we just love or politically cannot get rid of. Um, or just as best in class and want to tie to. So, um, you know, light footprint plus integration, plus the commitment on, you know, again, as Vibob said just the other day, we want to build soft software that people want to use. What a concept. Um, yeah. So it just, and, but again, Vibob, you know, we're thrilled to have him here. You know, he was also, he and I share one of those competitors. So we worked there, but he also, uh, the robotic um, the robotics that Walmart uses, he designed. So you really have some really exciting innovation and really kind of cutting edge, like the usability is paramount to him. And so, right. you know, and he's leading all of our products. So that's pretty exciting, you know, exciting. Um, but it's also great to be able to pick up the phone and he takes your call. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We're here with Kristen Valentine, the vice president at Epicor Software. We're talking about an overview of ERP systems in the marketplace. We've got a lot more to cover, but first we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 135. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyla Cheatham. And we're here with Kristen Valentine talking about an overview of ERP software and the ERP system market. Let's jump back into the conversation. That's a great overview. And I, and I think that a um, couple of things you touched on, I mean, the focus on, you've talked a lot about customer centricity, which also sort of includes the user experience and, and the user ease of use um, is critical. And then also, you know, the way I've described Epicor's leadership team now is, is sort of an all-star team. I mean, I, I do think that you guys have done a really good job of getting a lot of industry players that have been around for a while and have worked at other vendors. And you sort of assembled this um, team that's really added a lot of stability to the company. I mean, one thing, one concern I've had, and I've shared this with you, Kristen, is that 10 years ago, I mean, Epicor was kind of a mess as a company. I mean, they, they were, um, you know, exchange, changing hands quite a bit with PE firms, buying and selling them. They had gutted their ecosystem and the VAR network and created sort of an adversarial relationship with a lot of them. And what ended up happening is I think the product suffered, the ecosystem suffered, the customers, of course, um, suffered and all that. But I think what you guys have done in the last few years is, is sort of refocus and restabilize the company and now get back to the growth mode um, because it is a good product and it always has been a good product. I mean, it's a company, it's a, of course, a product that I was using, you know, or, or we were seeing clients use way before even you joined and others that are on the team now. So I think that that um, direction you guys are going uh, seems to be very positive from from you know, sort of an objective perspective on our side of things. Well, thank you. And and for the, for anybody listening in, that's why it was so freaking hard to get back on that top 10 list. <laughs> right. Because what, what Eric is talking about was, yes, you can have great software, but are you a partner? Um, right. And what's that vision? And what's in, and what's that go forward strategy? And so again, yep. I can take that Lamborghini to the car, you know, to the grocery store, but, but what is that, you know, is it, think about the maintenance of keeping a Lamborghini to drive your two and through three miles to the grocery store and you don't have truck space. It's just, it's a lot of, it's a lot of lift, uh, heavy lifting 
when in fact you just want something easy peasy and and get gets the job done um and i'm and i don't want to diminish it because of the depth that epicor has it's really nice to be able to look people in the eye and we get great feedback that you know people really enjoy working with epicor plus they really feel like the software makes a difference um but you know it's just kind of that shifting in that focus and i want to take a moment i I've, I've had the pleasure of working with lisa at oracle uh, QED, Infor, and now um, Epicor. So I think she's close to me in number of ERP vendors or closest I've come. Um, but but her vision and her leadership really does. And again, taking all of those best practices to the benefit of Epicor. Um, so building on really good software, all the things that Eric just talked about was, you know, the partnership, the ecosystem, the community, the interaction, uh, very, very, uh, those are equally important drivers in today's biz- in today's market. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Here's a, here's a, and by the way, um, again, right. Uh, wrong way here. Uh, download the, the top 10 ERP systems and let us know if you are reading it. If you happen to be multitasking and reading the, the top 10 ranking while we're chatting here, I'd love to hear feedback. Um, do we put Epicor in the right spot? Do we miss a vendor? Do we have someone overrated? I'd love to hear the feedback in the, I definitely want to hear about the overrated ones. Yes. <laughs> well, actually, I, us. yeah. <laughs> I, I have there's uh, someone uh, I forgot who it was. I think it was the Vapor Trail uh, handle that's talking, that's sort of chatting about Microsoft Dynamics and some of the concerns there. So they may think that person. I don't want to speak for that person, but they may think Microsoft is overrated in our in our top ten. But I'd, I'd be curious to hear from the uh, from the audience here. But here's a question that I, I've never thought of this question, but actually it's a great question that I would love to hear your response to. And I, and I it really, I just want to put you on the spot, Kristen, and this is a best, the best way, I, the best question I could find that totally puts you on the spot. Uh, but this is from Mohammed on uh, LinkedIn. Mohammed says, why is Epicor not focusing to be competitive in the Middle East like Dynamics, SAP, and Oracle are? So what are your thoughts? Are you guys, you know, truly multinational? Are you stronger in certain regions than others? Or what are your thoughts as it relates to the Middle East and maybe other parts of the world too? We're definitely stronger um, in certain parts of the of the world, and understand from companies like SAP, Oracle, um, and Microsoft. They obviously, you know, again talking about the origin, or you know, Epicor grew up from a U.S. based company and out. Mm-hmm. Um, Oracle very much that way, but Microsoft always has been a global foot, footprint. So, you know, they, and, and really the ERP is just kind of this great other thing that they can get. SAP has always been global. Um, and certainly we do have, in fact, um, Andy Cousins runs our EMEA um, division. And I know we're working to be much more aggressive and much more competitive because um, our kinetic manufacturing is absolutely multilingual and works very, very well there. Um, but, you know, we've recently hit the billion dollar mark, which is pretty exciting. Um, and, mm-hmm. you know, if you get a chance to Sam Monty can talk about kind of our financial performance and how well um, we've consistently been doing year over year to Eric's point with kind of this new management structure. Um, so we definitely see areas like the Middle East as growth areas and certainly um, you know, we look to do more there. Right. Right. So, um, I'll own it and Asia pack. Right. You know, unfortunately too often, you know, the middle East falls under other, which isn't fair to the middle East. Very, very important, but the different languages do, you know, present some obstacles. Um, and so that's, you know, the, the cost of getting into that, those markets can be a little bit higher. Right. But you do have, um, in fact, I met, I, I went to um, the Epicor conference earlier this year and um, I met a, I, I met one in particular, um, VAR, you know, someone who was the president of, a, of an Epicor VAR um, there. I think he was in Dubai, uh, if I remember correctly. So I'm sure there's more than just him, but I met at least one uh, VAR when I was there of, of a Middle East um, implementer of Epicor. Oh, yeah. Partner of Epicor. And, it, and if you go on Epicor's website, the website, you can find the partners that cover um, Middle East based in India, uh, as you mentioned, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, et cetera. But you can we have a listing of partners that are in the Middle East. Right. OK. Um, there was a question here around. No, I don't even remember what it was. Oh, here it is. 
This is from Tom on LinkedIn. And this is more of a general sort of a trendy sort of a question, just the general direction of the ERP software space. And I'd be curious to hear what you see in the market overall and how Epicor in particular is, is addressing this. But Tom asked the question of, will we see an increased interest for best of breed systems based on the development of composable ERP based on cloud native? And you used the word composable ERP earlier as well, uh, Kristen. And, and for those that don't know, or aren't familiar with the term best of breed essentially suggests that you have multiple systems that focus really well and are the best fit for different parts of your business. So instead of one single ERP system, you might have multiple systems that address different parts of your business with the idea being that you find a better fit, creates a little bit more technical complexity, may or may not be the best answer for you, but you know it could be a good option for, for you depending on what your needs are. How does Epicor view best of breed and where, where do you see best of breed going in general? Is that is that a, an emerging trend? Is it a dying trend? How do you see it fitting in? Well, the more things change, the more things they, you know, stay the same or vice versa. Uh, so there was a huge best of breed trend, actually, when um, I was with Oracle. And I'm going to actually cite uh, an interesting um, nugget that I learned at SAP, which has stayed with me throughout. And that is the best, best case fit to business scenario is 80% of mm -hmm. any software. Right. Best fit to business. So there's always going to be about 20% where you're going to have to relative to your, your market or your product or even your region. Um, but there, there's, you know, you're going to need, you know, buy, build or partner for that 20%. But here's the key thing. And again, this is an SAP stat. Six, the average fit to business is 60%. Think wow. about that. Huh. So 40% is buy, build, partner, which really does put move. So you, you know, in terms of best of breed, but you as the customer, if, if that's what your role is, the, the power shifts over to you. So, you know, Eric asked me kind of what things do you see changing? Well, I, I would say five to eight years ago, we started to see IT becoming strategic. They were putting their in, you know, they were putting their thumbprint on things. They were no longer, I want this, make it happen, IT. They were now being brought into the strategy discussions. And so, could, because that's a unique, wonderful role where they not only understand what technologies are available, they understand the company in which they need to work with them. And so that's where I do see much more, much more um, com, you know, breast of breed requirements for two things. One, understanding that nobody's going to be 100% for anything. And candidly, if they tell you that, they're liars, period. Right. Um, you know, just that's why there's 70 ERP um, options in the United States alone. So one, um, nobody's 100%. So in looking at that 40, looking at your own company and saying, you know what, I like you for all of this, but I really love this HR, for example. Um, you know, and so, yes, that kind of best of breed. And that's point number one. But the other thing, too, is you guys out there didn't just start business yesterday. You've got this collection of these investments and some of the stuff may be ugly, but it's working. Um, some of the stuff, as I mentioned, may be political, so you can't get rid of it. There's a very expensive, large PLM that, you know, has become a sacred cow, although rumor has it. It takes about seven years to implement um, you know, so you're so in, you can't. So, so those sacred cows or look at that offers that niche functionality that is my differentiator in the market. Again, I'll just use the PLM example, but you know, we all know one full size PLM doesn't fit all because you could be in frozen foods and that's an entirely different requirement than if you're, you know, we love this example, making bicycles, right? So, you know, what is the right, um, you know, products for your market who are made for your market. And so I actually do see now that where we are with all of those things kind of converging, A, IT is strategic, B, you've got investments and you got to continue to get value out of it because of the profit drivers that we're all working towards and C, that time to benefit. Um, I see, and when I say time to benefit, the whole rip and replace, good God, mm -hmm. you know, Nobody is looking, nobody's looking for a hobby or has all this free time on their jobs, right. nor is sitting around saying, huh, what to do with this extra cash? No. Um, so, you know, the, the point where you can, we can all kind of pack that parachute while we're getting ready to jump out is kind of the new normal. 
And mm -hmm. best of breed allows you to continue to use what you have, continue to be forward, not pull out critical applications that might, you know, like be customer centric while you're cleaning up other things, but continue this kind of evolutionary um, and, but, and then you benefit and then, you know, talk about that person who wants to protect their role, but then it truly is strategic because they're making an educated decision about that company's drivers, profit requirements, growth requirements, and they really can decide this is the right thing for us. We're no longer going to be told all you can eat, buy everything from us. Um, because not everything is going to fit your market. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great, great point. Uh, or, or a series of great points. What, as, as organizations think about, um, as they plan for ERP implementations, let's just assume there's some people on the on the discussion here who are trying to figure out, you know, what what's the best ERP system for me? And of course, one of the things you could do is download that uh, right there, QR code, top 10 ERP systems. I might give you some ideas and, and a starting point to look at. But what are some of the things that you would suggest to, to people that are about to embark on an ERP initiative of some sort? What are the, you know, what are those top things that they should be thinking about or aware of as they, as they get started? Um, the question obviously is, um, you know, that came up earlier is do, do not look to software to uh, put, be lipstick on the pig. Um, mm -hmm. First and foremost, take a dig deep, hard look at how you're doing business and saying, does this work for me? Yes, no. Um, and then, so when you start from your goals and when I say, you know, there, when does this work for me? Yes, no. That really means what are our end games? Um, and, and, and I don't mean to put too fine a point on it, but I am going to get promoted if we do X or I am likely to get fired if we don't do that's where your company's goals and drivers are. So First and foremost, what's the company marching to? Um, that's the first thing. And then look at, do those processes support that? Um, and and so take, taking that hard look at it. And then, and, and then I do really, really encourage you get the guidance from a third stage. One of the things that we love about third stage is they're completely unbiased. Um, Eric was terrific in giving you some very candid feedback now. We love to hear it. We always want the opportunity to be better. Um, but that's where you're really going to get, mm, based on your growth trajectory, I'd recommend this over that. Or, oh, by the way, I know what they're telling you, but you might really want to look deeper in that because they might not have that micro vertical functionality that's really your secret sauce in your market. Um, so, you, you know, so understand your processes and someone like Third Stage can really help you crystallize that. I've done enough business planning that until you get even your executives in the room, a lot of them actually have different objectives, different goals. Um, and so that's an important process that a third stage can bring all that together. And then once you then once you embark on that and you're working together, then look at the culture of the company. Um, do you want an ERP vendor or do you want a ERP partner? Because a relate, you know, a partner means that issues which are going to arise. We just discussed this, right? The 60% fit to business. Also, you guys know things are going to happen. Again, I'll go back to my home analogies, which I use a lot of times. I'd love to meet the person who's had a kitchen remodel done on time and on budget. Well, you know what? Believe it or not, software is not any different and it's equally disruptive. So, so issues happen. Um, but your, if you have a partnership, those issues become are just annoyances. Yeah. If you have a vendor, they're problems. Yeah. And so you really want to look at the culture and company uh, of, you know, the culture of the company in terms of, are they my partner? Um, do we see us as us or do we really feel like it's us and them? Right. Um, and then you'll get to, does the software meet my needs? But that's kind of how you want a short list is processes, third stage, culture, and then the software, because um, you wouldn't get to a short list that didn't meet your needs, um, you know, working with their third stage. Yeah, and, and I appreciate that. And, and one of the uh, things, too, that you you touched on is, that I think is really important is just looking at the you know, how valuable you might be as an organization to a given vendor. I think a lot of times companies are disappointed when they go um, 
they implement SAP or Oracle or Microsoft and they find out that they're just one of millions of customers and they're a small fish in a big pond and they don't get the attention they need during an implementation or post implementation for support and that sort of thing. Whereas, you know, sometimes for smaller, you know, kind of second tier, and I don't mean second tier as, as in terms of inferior, I mean, second tier as far as not one of the big three incumbents, a uh, company like Epicor and others in the market, um, a lot of times you're going to get more attention and you're going to get more resources and it's easier. You know, we've seen, for example, with you guys at Epicor, it's easier to escalate things within the organization than it might be at an SAP or a, certainly a Microsoft too, or anyone along those lines. So that's something to think about too. If you're, if you're a big, massive corporation, sure, you're going to get the attention of SAP and Oracle, but if you're not, um, you know, you have to look at that too. What, what, how, how are they going to partner, partner with me and how will my vendor give me the support I need, you know, going forward? Yeah, I had a, a different vendor than the first two I've already talked about, but I had two customer down situations and, um, the, the response was, well, we're going to wait until our answer is perfect. And my point to professional services is, do you understand the angst you're causing this customer by going dark for mm -hmm. six to eight weeks? I mean, they have got to report to their management. We need to communicate who, you know, and convey. And, you know, it's very, it's not uncommon for us to have, you know, weekly, sometimes biweekly status calls to make sure that we're all getting to where we want to, because at the end of the day, that's where the relationship is. Um, and a good, strong relationship, knowing, you know, empowers you guys on the, on the ground to be able to report to your superiors about what's going on. So you look good. Um, but also you have that confidence that it's moving forward. Um, I often say silence is suspicious, right? You know, and seriously, you got a problem and you're not hearing much. Are you feeling good? No. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Great, great advice. And great. That's sort of a great way to, to leave it in a good takeaway for, for the audience here today. All right. Thank you, Kristen. Great conversation. Really appreciate having you on the show here today. Uh, learned a lot. There's a lot more that we could have covered. So we'll definitely want to have you back on the show at some point in the future. Uh, so thank you for being here today and thank you to the audience for the great questions. And uh, we're going to uh, cover uh, some, some quick uh, follow-up from this, but first we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to play you, uh, we're going to shift gears a bit and play you a mashup from our past digital stratosphere events. So you can get a flavor of what to expect in our next digital stratosphere conference, which is coming up in October in Denver, Colorado. It's October 4th through the 6th. You can go to stratosphere 2023 and learn more or stratosphere 2023.com and learn more about that. Uh, but we'll play you that mashup here in just a moment. But first we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to transformation ground control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to third stage consulting group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 135. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. And uh, really appreciated having uh, Kristen on the show right before the break. In fact, if you want to learn more about some of the leading ERP systems in the market, um, as a follow-up to that conversation, you can download our top 10 ERP systems for 2024, as well as our 2024 Digital Enterprise Operations Report, which is a new report that's forthcoming here very shortly. You can pre-register for it now. When you register, you'll actually get the top 10 um, system ranking now. And then when the report is released here in a few weeks, you'll get the full report as well. So be sure to register for that. You can um, go to the link below um, where I've got the link to the 2024 report and you can download that there. So be sure to check that out. It's a great way to learn more about ERP systems in the marketplace as a supplementary uh, material to support the conversation we had with Kristen. And so 
we thought we'd keep with this theme here of providing some additional you know, thought leadership and understanding of the market by providing you a mashup of some past digital stratosphere events that we have hosted in the past and we'll be hosting again in October, the beginning part of October in Denver, Colorado. So if you're interested in joining that, you can go to stratosphere2023.com. You can learn more about the speaker lineup, the agenda, pricing, all that stuff. Uh, but before we get into this mashup, Kyler, you've got a discount code that we can use as listeners of the show that'll give us a, a discount. What what uh, can you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. So we want to make sure that all of our ground control community can join us for Stratosphere because it really is not only our third stage thought leadership, but all of the top thought leaders in the marketplace that really can provide that unbiased and unfiltered opinion to ensure you have success. So that's that's really our mission with this conference is to create an atmosphere which you can come and get the insights for your project without any pressure of selling you software or selling you different products. Um, it's really It really is for you. So with that, we wanted to provide a coupon code, which is stratosphere20. If you go to um, 2020 or stratosphere2023.com or the link below, you can register with the promo code stratosphere20 and get 20% off both of our ticket prices for our conference in Denver on October 4th through 6th. Yeah. And you and I will be there. We'll have uh, about a dozen other speakers on top of uh, you and I, um, some from third stage, some from other organizations, but the whole event is tech agnostic. Uh, it's meant to help you regardless of where you are in your digital transformation journey. Uh, should be a great time. We'll have live entertainment, networking opportunities, peer networking, um, all sorts of good stuff. So be sure to check that out. You can go to stratosphere2023.com and of course use the promo code to get the 20% discount on whichever pass uh, you prefer. So in the meantime, though, what we thought we'd do is play you a little mashup, uh, some clips from past digital stratosphere events uh, and conferences that we've we've hosted just to give you a feel for the type of stuff you can expect there. A wide variety of speakers, as you'll see here in the mashup, and even more so, I would say, in this one that we have coming up in October, um, just in the diversity of speakers we've continued to add to the lineup. And of course, it's fun to be able to do this in person again after doing it remotely for the last three years since the pandemic. So it'll be fun to get back into it. So. Um, all that being said, let's roll the mashup here of a past digital stratosphere conference events. Cleanse and Protect, led by Daryl Prockett. Uh, I'll just pass it over. I've spoken very, you missed out, Daryl. I spoke very highly of you. Uh oh. There's a lot of buildup, high expectations. <laughs> so I'm going to pass it, pass it on to you right now to talk about data and cybersecurity along with uh, Daniel and, and uh, um, Rohan. Rohan, which I will give him access right now to make sure he can speak while you're, while you're getting started here. Excellent. Great. All right. Well, I thank you everyone for coming. I know this is everyone's favorite topic as it is mine. And I wanted to just say one thing to you that's very important. If you take nothing else away from this session today, let it be this. Data is your biggest asset. And data is also your biggest liability. Okay. With that said, um, I want to introduce myself just very briefly. Um, my name is Daryl Crockett. I'm CEO of Alladatum. My two big professional passions in life are clean data and protected data. So I think that kind of kind of says it all. Um, I'm the CEO of Alladatum, and also I would like to announce uh, a, a very good strategic partnership with a company called Pylog. Uh, they're here uh, together with Eclipsis, assisting in that effort of cleaning data, keeping data clean, and then protecting that data. So, Daniel, would you like to say something about yourself? Introduce uh, yourself? Yeah. Um, thank you, Daryl. Um, uh, I'm a partner at Taft and Tennyson Hollister. Um, good to tune in again. Uh, I was on this morning's uh, session. Um, and uh, my practice as it relates to this uh, panel um, as I said earlier, it revolves around employment, uh, data privacy, and litigation. Uh, historically, I, I do, dealt with a lot of uh, workforce mobility issues um, and have a lot of experience regarding employee theft uh, and information security matters reg uh, relating to the workforce. Um, and so, you know, I echo what Daryl has said that, you know, your data is your, it, it, it's crucial, it's important. This is a, this is a very important seminar. We want to make it interesting for you. But uh, now, especially, there's a lot of uh, important things to know and, uh, and, and things to consider when regarding your data. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, excited to have you here. Uh, Rohan. Um, yeah. Uh, hi. Hi. Thanks for uh, introducing. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, been in the, I've been in the security, in the, I'm a secure, uh, consultant for uh, uh, Rena Partners um, and uh, been, you know, been in the industry for 15 years and have had various uh, different types of roles from security researcher to um, uh, uh, to direct, uh, to uh, managing a security program, um, you name it. So uh, been on the defensive side of things uh, for, the, uh, for all these years, uh, trying to keep the bad guys out. So, uh, but at the same time, uh, also been working with the companies to uh, to manage, uh, to deploy, manage their security programs for the last three years. That's wonderful. Well, excited to have you here, Rohan. We haven't presented together yet, so I'm excited uh, that we have this opportunity together. Wonderful. All right, so let's talk first about the um, aspect of data and clean data and really what you should be thinking about right now. Um, I know all of us are washing our hands furiously. Uh, that's part of our uh, daily effort multiple times a day, but also I've been thinking a lot about this period of time and the situation that companies are in right now. And um, I really do believe that this is the absolute best opportunity we've had in decades to take the time to clean the data that we're so reliant on in making decisions for our corporations, in managing our customers, in our procurement spending, in our scientific data. This is really the opportune time. And let's talk about those initiatives that depend so heavily on data. We know that 90% of our CEIOs are experiencing some sort of failure in their cloud migrations because they really don't understand and didn't plan properly for that data migration and the complexity of their data and perhaps the uncleanness of their data going into this, into this initiative. So let's think about it like this. If we have um, a wonderful end goal of having great BI and AI and a data lake with lots of great information in it, great data, and we're going to base our business decisions on that data, then it only makes sense that that data should be as clean and as trusted as possible. So we want to think about trusted data. And how do we get to data being trusted? We have to have clean data to start with and some sort of governance process that checks that data as it's going into the data lake or into those group repositories information upon which we're going to then connect to and base our decisions. If we talk about ERPs, we say that 25% of the ERP projects are going to take longer, and a lot of that is going to be attributable to the problems that we see with data cleanliness. It's the perfect time right now, like I said, to do your ERP data cleansing uh, work associated with your um, digital transformations, and here's why. Most times when we're trying to do a project, the data team, whether it's the in-house business team or uh, uh, some special team that you've hired like our company to kind of come in and help, the project leadership has kind of crammed us into this little space that is after the blueprint phase of our project and before the go live. And in there, we have to clean all of the data and get as clean as possible for all of the data that the company has despite the fact that they hadn't cleaned it for the last five years and that's why it's so messy in to begin with so now we've kind of crammed down and said clean all the data clean all the mistakes that we've had over the last x years cleaned all in a very short period of time and that's not really a rational thought so what we want to try to do is extend all right Trying to figure out which way to go on the picture here. But we want to try to extend that period of time that we have to clean data. So if you're one of those groups that has delayed your project, postponed it, paused it, and you're not yet started into that blueprint stage, please don't think you have to wait until that time to clean your data. 
You should get started now. We'll talk about why. Cleaning your data and looking at that granular data as part of your project, or geez, any BI project or any initiative that you have that would involve data, and there's very few that don't involve data, by the way. Finding that information out about what's really wrong with the data can expose important issues that if we wait until that little window they give us to do normally on a project, we may find out kind of late in that project, whoa, we never knew this about our data. And guess what? We're going to have to know, change our configuration in the software and retest everything and retry the data because something went wrong. So looking at that data now, sooner rather than later, is actually going to expose some important issues that could save you important money for either in project delays or in cleaning that data after the fact or having to live with that dirty data. That's like the worst option that we can have. Um, but what really it does, it's going to de-risk your overall project and timeline. So if we can find these things early and if we can have more time now to start cleaning the data and having a, an intelligent approach associated with that, that's what we really want to do. We really want to get in there, look at that data, start cleaning it, put a plan, an action plan in place, and give our project an overall a better shot at coming in on time and on budget, de-risking that process. Let's talk about who does this data cleansing effort. Well, um, I spend a lot of time these days assisting companies understanding what tools they need, what people they need to do this work, what can they do now, what needs to be done by hand, and what needs to be done really better is done by outside agency or by uh, intelligent tools that can help automate this process. And I'm not going to say there's any one size fits all here, but I will tell you that a good part of the data cleansing that we do do involves either human beings in your business cleaning the data or reviewing the data that has been cleaned through tools or an outside agency. This is a great job for a remote workforce. Think about it. It's, it's something you can chunk up. It's something that people can do for an hour or two or a day or so when they're not so busy with other things. They are very familiar with the data. They're people that are touching and working with that data every day. We want them to be engaged in this and it's a great thing for them to do with the proper tools and guidance in a remote workforce situation like we have right now. It's easy to manage and monitor and measure this work. It's very quantifiable. We gave you 500 records on Monday with tools and guidance and monitoring, which is the kind of thing that we usually do to help companies set up. You can measure and monitor this. I know a lot of the people on some of the earlier calls that we had said, you know, I'm concerned because I have employees that work for me. They say they can't get on or not really sure what they're doing during the day. If you give them chunks of data to clean measure, to clean and, and, and review, well, that's a pretty easy thing to set up, a good use of their time and easy to measure. And this is probably the biggest thing of all. This effort that you do now, especially if you do it in your material master and in your supplier master and your customer master, this will result in increased efficiencies and cost reductions before you ever go live on your ERP. It'll start almost right away as you start to realize that you're buying the same uh, type of material from multiple vendors for different prices, that you're actually listing multiple customers and you didn't have them aggregated so you don't really knew, know what business you're doing with them. So, uh, you know, after all this saying, it's a de-risk, it saves us time, I can tell you, I can show you ways proven methods that people can actually save money by doing this initiative that's absolutely the opportune time to do it. Just a quick little slide here to kind of show what that process looks like. So when you're cleaning that data, what, what are we actually talking about doing? We're talking about going through a process where we cleanse and catalog the customer master data. Again, sometimes this is a human being effort. Sometimes it's aided with tools and systems. And then you create these new clean records 
you you validate that record that it's cleaned so you have a person that cleans it and a person that validates it maybe your outside validation is in place where you're sending records out to your supply chain and saying hey did we get this right is this really the right way to describe this material is this really your address this is a super great time to do this um, and then once you get that data cleaned, even before you're in the projects, this is where the project starts, you're starting to establish an MDM process. How do I create materials and customers a little bit better? Can I put a temporary interim process in place so I'm not creating any new but more bad data? Then we use that data like we talked about with that kind of secret there that we can actually save money and create efficiencies in our projects. We can do that right here where we start to search for efficiencies because we already have stuff that we've worked on. And we try to keep it clean and then we run it into the pipeline of what we would consider to be that normal project conveyor belt that we're trying to jam all this into. We do our mapping sessions with the integration team. We test load our data and here we go. Now we're going live. So think about the value that this has right now. This is a really great time to do this. And of course, yeah. if you're already in a project, I think that's the time too. <laughs> you can still keep cleaning your data. One all right. One question, Daryl, that, sure, yeah. that I thought I'd throw out at you, or more of a comment, is uh, seems like this might be a good thing to do even if you're not in the middle of an ERP migration. Which oh my gosh, absolutely yes. Um, I yeah, it does save money, especially if you're a company that has a lot of master data records. So got a lot of materials, complex pricing, or a lot of customers and suppliers. Yes, absolutely, everyone should be doing this. It's probably the number one thing that you can do for the highest ROI right now. I believe. In, in, in the industry. And it'll actually help you pay for that ERP project if you get it done and started pretty soon. We're here playing you a mashup of some of the past digital stratosphere conferences. Our new, our latest upcoming digital stratosphere conference is going to be October 4th through the 6th in Denver, Colorado. You can learn more about that at stratosphere2023.com. You can see the speaker lineup, the agenda, the pricing, all that good stuff, stratosphere2023.com. In the meantime, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and keep playing you this, this mashup of other uh, speakers that we have had at past conferences. So stick around. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. When I wake up, well, I know I'm going to be, I'm going to be the man who wakes up next to you. When I go out. Hi, this is Eric Kimberling with Third Stage Consulting and your host of Transformation Ground Control. I want to encourage you to read our Guide to Organizational Change Management. It's a free report or a free guide that we published. It's one that I actually wrote that talks about best practices and lessons learned as it relates to change management. So as you know, on this podcast, we cover a lot of stuff related to the human sides of change, organizational change management, including training, communications, org design, all kinds of stuff as it relates to change management. So if you're trying to learn more about change management or you're looking for more direction and ideas on how to get started on your change management strategy and your overall journey, be sure to check out this guide. You can read it by scanning the QR code on the screen in front of you or in the links below for this particular podcast episode. You can find a link to uh, take you to the page that will allow you to register to go ahead and download that and read it for free. So be sure to check it out. It's the Guide to Organizational Change Management uh, written by yours truly. I hope you enjoy it. Let me know what you think and hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 135. We're here playing you a mashup of past Digital Stratosphere conference events, just to give you a flavor of what to expect at our next Digital Stratosphere, which is coming up in October, October 4, 5, and 6 in Denver, Colorado. You can learn more about the event and see the lineup at stratosphere2023.com. But in the meantime, let's jump back into the mashup of past events that we've hosted. The online assessment, uh, the anonymous surveys, it's quantitative, and then the qualitative focus groups that we, we guide through with, with different people. Um, and then part of the question that I'll uh, preface with the fact that I'm completely biased in answering this question, but would an external consultant help? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think they would because I am an external consultant and I would benefit from that. So that uh, just to be hundred uh, percent transparent in the, the, uh, the, 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 the one bias I do have, in addition to the fact that I'm biased towards change management, um, that's the other one. Um, and then another, another comment here is taking pause and then realigning strategies um, with business processes is what an enterprise must focus on. So kind of consistent with what we saw in the data or in the, the poll responses, 
you know, it's realignment of strategies, focus on processes. I think those are the two uh, top ones. And uh, you do those two things. I think that kind of sets the tone or the, the foundation for uh, a lot of the, the uh, follow-up execution or redirection or pivoting that might happen from there. So one of the common things we see with, with organizations is that uh, they, run into, they run into a lot of different problems when they, when they rush through projects. You, you see a lot of times companies will uh, make a decision about a new technology tool and they'll decide that, hey, we're just going to, we're excited. We've got a lot of momentum. The team's on board, executives on board. They've approved a budget, all this stuff. And we just sort of jump right in and, and just start doing stuff. And what we're finding now is a lot of companies that had done that and they had kind of started building a transformation on a weak foundation or a sort of a house of cards because they didn't really have their, their ducks in a row. They didn't have alignment. They didn't have clear business processes. They didn't have their data figured out. They didn't, a lot of stuff they didn't do. And then they started to build on that and they start to figure out that the foundation is pretty shaky. The good news, if they're you know, trying to be looking at the bright side of things today, is that for some of us, it's an opportunity to step back and look at, okay, where did we mess up that foundation and how could we maybe go back and fix some of that? Especially if we're in a position where we've been told to slow things down or you know, things are so uncertain that we can't keep investing at the same rate that we have been in this project, or maybe we've been told to completely stop the project, or maybe we're uncertain. I, I think there was about, uh, yesterday, there was 26% of you that said that you were uncertain how your project would be impacted, which is a very telling number. I mean, that's a pretty high number of you that just, you just don't know yet. Granted, it's only been, what, a few weeks, maybe a couple months since this really started to unfold, this whole situation, but that's still a fairly high number. So, when there is that sort of uncertainty or doubt or uh, things are slowing down, whatever the case may be, it's a great opportunity now to look at what is it that we can do to avoid some of these problems that so many companies run into when things are good, you know, when the economy is good and when uh, companies have money and they decide they're going to invest a lot of money in a, in a big project. I mean, in some ways that's a good thing, but there's a dark side of that where companies make a lot of bad decisions and the money and the abundant resources kind of masks some of those problems. And I think what we see now is some of these problems are being exposed. And the good news, though, is it creates an opportunity for us to either fix those things or if we're about to embark on a transformation sometime this year or in the near future or later this year, we can really focus on how can we make sure we avoid these problems of not having enough you know, operational direction or clarity on how our processes should look going forward or um, we're making sure we're not just handing the keys over to the system integrator and assuming they're just going to figure things out, and take care of it all for us or spinning our wheels making decisions while the consultants are, are charging by the hour. We're sitting there trying to figure out what we want to be when we grow up. You've got a big team of consultants over here that are just waiting for you to decide what you want and you're, you're paying for that time. Um, there's also the point of uh, technology driving the business rather than the business driving the technology. Um, today's ERP systems are, are generally so flexible that it, it's, a, it's a pitfall to fall into when you assume that the system's just going to dictate to you or tell you how to, how to run your business, um, as well as some of the other failure points you see on the, on the bottom uh, line here. Too much time and money spent on a project. Team gets frustrated. It's a lot to absorb. Lack of ownership of my end. These are all problems that some of you may have been experiencing. I'd love to hear your comments if you have experienced any of these things with your current project or if there's things you're trying to address with your current project. But we see that uh, now is a good time to step back and figure out how can we avoid either avoid these problems or mitigate these problems that have already started to materialize in our projects. Any thoughts from the, the other speakers? Any, any, uh, anything that resonates with you guys or, or things that, that you would add to this? Yeah, I, Eric, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the speed. Um, obviously, uh, a company doesn't want to invest too much time and too much money on a project, very clear. But I, I'm seeing another trend uh, in the market, and especially when you're looking at a cloud migration. There's a lot of incentive for the system integrators and the software company themselves to accelerate your project beyond what might be reasonably uh, healthy, okay? So that, that push to get things done as quickly as possible might seem like uh, an attractive thing on the surface, but may actually end up being uh, a very bad problem for the project where you're not um, getting enough time to, as you know, 
put your data in, clean your data, or do your testing, uh, and really to thoroughly think through all the implications and all the integrations and configurations that are necessary to implement the system. So I, th I think that's a, a problem. In fact, I'd say to you that the system integrator and the, soft, the, the people that sold you the software, that company is incentivized to push you as fast as they can in many cases. And I think there's going to be a lot of make up for lost time trying to get the revenue in to make up for the, the, the delays that we're experiencing right now due to COVID. Yeah. Another thing Daryl tied into that is we're hearing a lot about companies now have bandwidth and availability. But what we're seeing is sometimes people who haven't done this before, maybe they're not qualified, they're certainly not trained on it, are pushed into an ERP implementation, for example, and said, let's get this done in the next few months. We've got all of us available. Let's just do it. They're decreasing the, uh, the, the dependence on consultants and outside help. Just assuming that with extra people, they can just do it all themselves in a controlled amount of time. And that that ties in with what you're saying. That's a very big mistake because mistakes are made. You, you put the wrong uh, requirements in. It just, it extends on budget, timeline, and risk. And, you know, people that are thinking of doing that, businesses that are thinking of doing that, of engaging more and using more of their employees in that, I mean, that's not a bad, bad idea. If you're going to do that, but get some outside support, get coaching, get leadership to at least assist your team in making sure that you're doing the right things in the right way. Because if you're, if you're just going to expect all of a sudden people that are naturally available to you just because their regular jobs might be less intense right now, doesn't automatically overnight give them all the wisdom, training, and experience of decades of project implementation uh, the way you would for the team that you might have tapped uh, prior to COVID and this new kind of approach. So get help. And, and I'll tell you, one of the um, of these that, that really resonates with me is this uh, decisions being made while the meter is running on expensive consultants. And, um, you know, in uh, yeah, at Raven, we review uh, completed projects, so post-mortem, and that comes up all the time where a project is delayed, which requires, you know, extra consulting time, um, because uh, a process decision sat in the inbox of an executive who was on vacation or just didn't see, um, you know, the, that particular project as, as being a priority. And I think, you know, in the, in the new world, not, nobody's taking vacation anymore. So that's not necessarily an excuse for a, um, you know, executive not being able to, to focus on it. But you know, that is a common one we hear. And I think, you know, in the current climate, that's probably less so because people are not traveling as much and, and things like that. So, you know, I think it presents an opportunity there. And I, I would add, we talked earlier about, you know, taking the time to reassess alignment with organizational priorities. I mean, digital transformations are long in, in, in timelines anyway and we often have turnover at the leadership level which can affect alignment but we have a situation now as has already been pointed out where there are businesses that are looking whether they're going to uh, align in certain sectors certain product lines etc that can do better in the current environment does the digital transformation priorities align with that new direction and one of the things i would i would also say is in order to avoid that timeline uh, accelerate or rather have the consultants uh, clock running at a hyperspeed as we wait. Yesterday, there was a session and it had to do with renegotiating contracts. And I think that you have to, you know, really impress upon your vendors that they have to find a new level of flexibility that may not have been provided for in the contract. In fact, right before this call, I was on uh, with one of my people with a, you know, very, very large opportunity for us, you know, many, many thousands of users and we had to adjust our expectation to align with the fact that they are doing just what I described. So I think flexibility amongst your vendors is something that you have to have very discreet conversations about and soon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And even if there's uncertainty, you know, and you don't know what's gonna happen, it's still an opportunity to say, okay, well, let's get ahead of this and let's not wait for us to be told that, hey, we're, we're slamming the brakes or we're, canceling the whole thing. You, you don't want to assume the worst, but you also want to prepare and have options in mind and, and 
be ahead of it to where you can be part of the solution. And, and where we see a lot of companies that talking about change management and buy-in or lack thereof, a lot of project teams, this just sort of happens to, you know, you're told that, no, we're not, we're stopping or we're, we're slowing down and you kind of get that mandate from the top and it still may happen. But if you can get ahead of it and say, well, here's some options, it's not all or nothing. We don't have to be at this high burn rate. We don't have to be at zero, but we could be somewhere in between. And what are some of those ways that we could, you know, find a good, good, good compromise there? Oops. Um, another, uh, a few other things to think about, and this is where, um, you know, Sean from, from Rena, if, if you're able to join in here, I think I've, I've made you a co-host, so you should be able to unmute. Um, Sean, what are your, some of your thoughts on, uh, you know, depending on what phase you are in the project, I know you had some uh, some thoughts here on, you know, how this can, uh, you, you, you would you tackle it differently depending on where you are in the project, which is a really good point because there's things you can do differently uh, if you're about to start a project versus if you're about to go live, you know, what are the things you should be thinking about or considering as you, as you go through this year? Yeah, I think the feedback from the, the uh, polling that you did you know, the first two gates, I think that you want to be able to pass are, okay, is there anything fundamentally different about our strategy um, in general? And then with, with particular initiatives that we might be undertaking, if the answer is no, then it's okay, where are we in the stage of this initiative? Because there was a reason why you undertook the initiative in, in the first place. And so if you're still in the planning and design stage, well, it gives you some more runway likely more capacity to make sure that you get thoroughly vetted requirements. Um, you know, a lot of the, the, the topics thus far, or conversation thus far has also been about alignment and re-engaging with sponsors. This can all be done um, still effectively with, with remote collaboration tools, I think, and, and with minimal cash outlay, you know, if you've got the internal resources now with capacity to do so. If you're in the execution phase, gives you an opportunity to button up some of the uh, documentation or uh, training materials, checklists, uh, issues lists that may have fallen by the wayside over the course of the, the execution. If you're on the precipice of going live, it gives you an opportunity for a soft launch, um, for, for piloting certain aspects. I think that the underlying uh, emphasis here is that, you know, unless you've been strategically uh, disrupted in some way by, by the situation, I think that the, the, the key is to have the discipline and focus to continue with the, the initiative that you undertook because there was a reason for it um, and use the opportunity to shore up uh, where you may have had shortcomings. Yeah, that's, that's great feedback. And, you know, a lot, you, you kind of, as you were explaining that, Sean, I was thinking back to something Daryl said around, you know, uh, the, the system integrator pushing and saying, hey, no, 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 stay the course, keep doing what you're doing. And, you know, and, and someone asked why, by the way, Daryl, you know, one of the questions, was I th which I think you, you did answer be, uh, after the person typed this, but someone said, you know, why are system integrators pushing? And this is a really important time to think about, you know, what are the, where are all of our interests aligned? Where are all of our bias? And system integrators right now are, are hurting because their business model in many ways is being completely disrupted because their business model isn't built for this sort of uh, remote consulting and whatnot. Their business model is based on getting people boots on the ground and, you know, building as much time as they can. So when a company says, Hey, hold on, we're going to take a time out and try and figure out what direction we should be going that that hurts them. So there, you know, there's going to be sort of an incentive to say, well, let's just keep going. Let's just stay the course, you know, our product, SAP Oracle, whatever it is, will help you navigate some of these challenges. But you really have to look at, you know, why, why did we undertake this project in the first place and how has that changed? And let's make sure that the whole project is aligned with that. Maybe nothing changes and you keep doing what you're doing, but it's highly likely that you're going to need to do something different to adjust your project for, uh, for this new reality. Even if you're not going to slow down, you still need to make sure you're not going too fast toward the wrong, toward the wrong goal. But these are some, some great ideas on, you know, depending on where you are, in the project at different phases, some ways that you can take advantage of that downtime in a low cost way too, by the way, you know, a lot of this stuff isn't super focused on uh, investing in new technology or buying more software licenses or making big long-term commitments on a cloud contract or whatever. These are things that a most, you know, you should have been doing anyway and B 
um, it's pretty low cost, low risk. So that's what we're trying to convey here today or share or some ideas on how to, how to really um, take advantage of the, the situation and, and tighten up your, your project. Maybe Eric, maybe big things are changing too. Maybe you are rethinking the depth and breadth of this project, not so much for uh, delaying or spreading it out, but maybe just generally. It might be that if your particular project was focused primarily on a technology acquisition and implementation and really hadn't looked at the underlying problems that led up to that, because you didn't have time or it just didn't happen the right way. Now all of a sudden there's this big, you know, money problem or pause or time issue or resource issue that causes you to rethink the thing. You know, it could be a pretty big change. It could be, you know, a change. Do we really need to do this? Are there other ways to do this? And, and I would be, you know, not a good consultant if I didn't say, I think you need to put all those things on the table and just run through them most of the time your reasoning was sound and the reason that you're doing this continues on, but don't overlook the fact that you have a great opportunity to kind of shake things up and really look at things and you should take a day or two or a week or so to think about that if you can spare that time. Right, absolutely. We're here playing you a mashup of some of the past digital stratosphere conferences. Our new, our latest upcoming digital stratosphere conference is going to be October 4th through the 6th in Denver, Colorado. You can learn more about that at stratosphere2023.com. You can see the speaker lineup, the agenda, the pricing, all that good stuff, stratosphere2023.com. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and keep playing you this, this mashup of other uh, speakers that we have had at past conferences. So stick around. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. Could you whisper in my ear the things you want to feel? Interested in working for a company that truly values your unique skills and experience? Here at Third Stage, we don't hire based on resumes alone. We look at the full candidate, experience, and willingness to provide excellent service for our clients. Within a technology independent and agnostic consulting firm, you have the opportunity to learn across industries with a diverse group of clients. Our consultants also have the opportunity to diversify their portfolio and learn across technology systems. If you're interested in joining a high growth entrepreneurial organization, please reach out to us at work at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 135. We're here playing you a mashup of past Digital Stratosphere conference events, just to give you a flavor of what to expect at our next Digital Stratosphere, which is coming up in October, October 4, 5, and 6 in Denver, Colorado. You can learn more about the event and see the lineup at stratosphere2023.com. But in the meantime, let's jump back into the mashup of past events that we've hosted. The overall digital strategy and what it is we're trying to accomplish as an organization with our transformation, it's important to think about this whole concept of alignment. And I know uh, this is something that I, I talked quite a bit about yesterday. I, I heard Marcus and a couple others mention the concept of alignment. It's a pretty vague, sort of a nebulous term, but, but really when we think about misalignment and the dynamics of what often happens with organizations going through their implementations or their transformations is they, they experience some sort of a disconnect between what they're trying to accomplish as an organization strategically and what's actually happening boots on the ground with the transformation itself. And I think I mentioned a, a couple examples yesterday of how that manifests itself uh, in, a, in a project. And maybe just to walk through that again, just to, to give you some context, and maybe some of you can relate to this. And I'd love to hear your, your chat comments if you've had any experience related to what I'm describing here, or if you have other related experience uh, related to, to uh, misalignment. Now, a lot of times, let's start on the surface. When we think about misalignment, a lot of times people will think, well, you know, we're aligned as an organization because our executive team is totally on board with this project. They approved it. Um, they, they're on board with the budget. They're on board with putting in new technology. They're on board with using technology out of the box, minimizing customization. And on the surface, you talk through some of that stuff and it sounds like we're all aligned. We're all on the same page. We're all marching in the same direction. And you know, we may call it good at that point and sort of move down to the, the mid-level management and then ultimately the frontline end users to make sure they're all aligned too. And uh, I'll get to that in a second. But 
before I get to the, the frontline people and the mid-level management, even just at the executive level, what ends up happening is we haven't fully articulated typically um, when we go through this process, typically the executives and the project team, the transformation project team have not fully articulated what exactly this transformation is, what it means, how, how it's defined for, for us as an organization. And we have to go a level deeper than what I just described as far as, you know, no customization, for example, or um, we want a single ERP system for our entire enterprise, or we want to create a common operating model. You know, those are all great. You know, those are all great grand ambitions, but they're very vague and it doesn't really give us a lot of direction when we're going to, to define our transformation and define our project. And so what ends up happening is you take that very vague high level strategy and then you get down to the digital transformation team, the project team, and then ultimately the, the end users and all the stakeholders and people that are affected by the project. And there's a there's a there's not only a disconnect, but there's a lack of clarity on what exactly this means. And oftentimes those high level ambitions are so vague and unattainable in many ways, or they're not 100 percent unattainable, I should say, um, that the project team ends up making decisions that they think is best, but ultimately they're shooting in the dark and they end up sort of going off off path or veering in a different direction. So just to give you an example, let's take that, you know, that common operating model concept. Let's just say one of your executive uh, stakeholders or your, your uh, executive goals for this project is to create an operating model that's, that's common and standardized across your organization. Well, that's great. But first of all, most organizations don't get there hundred percent. Usually it's not, a blanket statement or a blanket ambition that that applies equally to all your different functions and business processes. So inevitably you get into the project and you find that, okay, we can't have a, a fully synchronous, 100% standardized operating model because there's something different about this organization or this part of the organization over here or over here. And, um, and so then you start having to make decisions around, well, how am I going to deal with that? How am I going to address that? Do, is it okay to address that? The fact that I'm getting a lot of pushback here at the local level at this part of the organization over here. And without that clear direction, it, again, it's, it's shooting in the dark. And what's probably going to end up winning out in those arguments is the, the path of least resistance. And the path of least resistance is to go back and sort of pave the cow paths and implement technologies and processes that are more similar to where you are today versus what you could be in the future. So I'm trying to simplify or kind of break down at a summary level of this long-term big strategic dynamic that oftentimes plays out in these transformations with just one example. But you take that one example of common operating model, there's dozens of other decisions and uh, variables that have to be defined as part of your strategy so that you have clear direction and clarity of what this project is going to mean. And so that you don't leave your project team guessing as to what, you know, what this transformation should entail. And when we look at the root causes of failure, so when we get hired to go in and do project recovery for a failed project, or if someone like Marcus or other attorneys hire us to be an expert witness, we often find that that level of misalignment is a, is a root cause of why the projects fail. And, no matter how good your system integrator is or how good your project team is or how good your technology is, even how good your change management team is, you're not going to be able to overcome that level of misalignment if you haven't addressed that early on. So the, the whole idea here with the digital strategy and defining that strategy and roadmap for the future is to make sure that you have um, clarity and, and a clear vision and direction for what this project is going to entail uh, for your organization. And that's what we'll, we'll talk about here today is how do we overcome that misalignment? How do we get aligned? And how do we drive alignment strategically for our long-term roadmap? So you may recognize a slide that looks similar to this yesterday. Um, I apologize, the yellow, uh, the middle box is not sharing as well as it looks on my, on my screen here. But the general gist of this from what we talked about yesterday is that, you know, how do you reach that third stage of success is the, is the big question here. And we want to have a good understanding of, of how to get there. And, and the whole idea is how do we define a digital strategy and roadmap that helps us get to that third stage? And what we find is that most organizations don't get stuck in that first stage. So if you recall, the first stage is sort of the, that massive failure. Those are the projects that never really get off the ground. They were doomed from the beginning and they just, you know, end up in a disaster. And a lot of times you read about it in the news or hear about it in the news, if it's a larger or well-known organization. The reality is, is that most organizations don't struggle with that. I mean, most organizations are competent enough to get past that first stage um, with the exception of, you know, the waste managements or the Hershey's of the world or and some of the others that, that Marcus talked about yesterday. 
Um, but the problem is you hear about them when they fail, especially when it's a big company. The, the bigger challenge and the bigger risk and the more common risk is the second stage, which is those are the sort of the moderate successes or the moderate failures, however you want to look at it. Those are the ones that, yeah, you, you got some technology up and running, you, you tweak some business processes, you got some value, but you didn't get everything you expected or, or even a majority of what you expected out of the system. You took too long. You took more money than expected. It took more resources. It created more chaos. You know, you know, at the end of the day, everyone's still standing, but it was, it was a lot more disruptive and painful than it needed to be. And then ultimately, you know, you look at the third stage, which a minority of organizations ever reached that third stage, but that's really what we want to strive for when we're defining our digital strategy is how do we create that long-term roadmap to get us there? And how do we avoid that pitfall that 80% or more of organizations get stuck in, stuck in, in that, that second stage that, that are mentioned here. So I'm going to go through uh, 10 steps. There's really 10 key parts of defining a digital strategy. And it's sort of a sequential, semi-sequential sequence of events that you should really be going through to, to get from wherever you might be today and assuming that your executives and your organization as a whole has a general clear direction of where they're going. And, and quite frankly, most organizations we work with, they sort of know, you know, they know where they're headed. They know what their strategy is. They know what their strengths and weaknesses are. It's pretty rare that we have to get involved in some real, you know, heavy hitting strategic overhauling of, of organizations. Usually they have, you know, they've, they're successful and they've grown and, you know, they, they figured out a way to navigate their industries and their competition and whatnot. But the bigger challenge is connecting the dots between that relatively clear corporate strategy with something as nebulous or as vague as a digital transformation. And that's that's what these 10 steps are intended to do is to get us to that point to where we can take that high level strategy that's probably rattling around in everyone's heads within your organization. But we're formalizing it and we're translating it, articulating it in a way that's definitive for a digital strategy and for an overall digital roadmap and ultimately a detailed project plan that's going to help us get there over however many years that it might take. So the first thing is the uh, is articulating organizational strategy. So ensuring that we have a uh, clear vision of what it is that we're trying to accomplish as an organization. And usually when we go in as, as consultants, you know, it's usually just a matter of picking the brains of people that are, you know, on the executive team and upper level management to understand what those big picture objectives are. But then the whole goal is not just to understand what those objectives are, but then to start to translate it down to the next level of details, to start asking questions and getting clarity and definition around the next level of detail below. And generally, we'll do this with a, a strategy articulation map, which is sort of a, a hierarchical, you know, starting at the top with, with some high level um, strategies, which actually it, it's a, a bit hard to read, but the top left corner where it's numbered one is one of the first things we do is that strategy articulation map where at the top you have your, your strategy and objectives, your high level corporate strategies and objectives. And then you unpack below that, what are the goals and objectives of the transformation and what are those decision points for the transformation in how they're going to enable or support those higher level goals and objectives. So, you know, this is a, a sort of a first pass or starting to dig below the surface of defining what those those um, high level parameters are for the transformation. And as part of that, and as you look at that visual on the left side, as part of this whole articulation of organizational strategy, we then get into defining where on the spectrum your organization falls for a number of strategic decisions that need to be made as part of a, a transformation. So for example, I use, I use the, the example, which is a really big one, and it's important to most, if not all organizations we work with, which is defining what level of standardization do we want to have within an organization and what level of independence or flexibility do we want to have? So, and then obviously there's a, there's a continuum there. It's not a either or answer. It's usually a, a scale of, you know, on a scale of one to 10, where do we want to fall in terms of retaining flexibility and having mass uh, optimal flexibility versus having optimal or maximum standardization and common commonality and efficiency. And again, most organizations are somewhere in between. The other thing is that it's not just a one, it's not just one answer for the entire organization. Usually we break that down by, um, by business unit. We could break it down by business processes within the business units to look at, you know, for the finance organization in Latin America, um, this is what it looks like. 
um, which may look different than the finance organization in, uh, in, in the U S or in Europe. Um, maybe even a better example would be, you know, anytime you have, uh, any sort of customer or service facing processes. So sales or customer service type processes, a lot of times those functions are more likely to remain a bit more flexible or a bit more localized. Whereas something like a finance, other than some of the regulatory finance stuff at the local level, you know, finance, GL, accounting, APAR, that sort of stuff. A lot of times that's more apt to be standardized. So you have different answers for different processes and, and you really want to have clarity and unpacking that with the executive team so that the executives are all on the same page with, yes, this is sort of the, the way the dials are in place for this, this transformation. So that then when we get down to the next layer, which is putting together the detailed project plan and uh, ultimately selecting and implementing technology, we have a pretty clear roadmap. We have a pretty clear set of parameters and we're not guessing, we're not shooting in the dark, trying to translate day-to-day -day activities into some, you know, vague grand ambition that doesn't make a lot of sense, you know, at, at the tactical level. So that's just an example of how we articulate that organizational strategy and how that, that uh, definition is so important early on. And ultimately what we do too, um, as part of this, which is very important and it's not mentioned on the slide here, but generally we will not only define sort of where the variables lie for each, each part of the business and each of the decisions that need to be made for any given organization, but then we look at, well, what are the risks of that? So we just made all these decisions we also want to look at what the, the trade-offs are. So we, we may have mitigated some risk by making decisions A, B, and C, but decisions A, B, and C have their own risks. And what are those risks and how are we going to mitigate them? So, you know, for example, just sticking with that, that common operating model theme, if we say we're going to, you know, standardize our finance function across uh, the globe, the good news is it's going to drive common business processes. It's going to drive efficiency. It's going to drive better transparency and visibility into financial data. But what what's the risk that we just created? And every decision like that, we've we may have addressed some other issues and pain points, but we've also created some risk inevitably and unintentionally, of course. So in that case, you know, the risk is that that's going to be a pretty big change for our organization to to move all of our finance groups to a common operating model, and certainly if we're moving to a shared service model, that's going to be an even bigger change. So there's risk there. What are we going to do to address that risk? And now we know that. By the way, when we talk about our change management strategy, we really need to hone in on that finance function because that's going to be a massive change for them. Um, other parts of the organization still need change management, but maybe finance ends up being the one that's going to be the most impacted and where we really want to invest most of our time um, from a change perspective. So that I'm just going through sort of a, a uh, example scenario of how this stuff plays out in, in terms of defining a, a strategy, a transformation strategy for an organization. So the, that's the first step is to articulate that organizational strategy and not only articulate it, but unpack it and define it in detail that gives the transformation team enough understanding and direction on how this the project's going to play out or, or how the project should play out to support the overall goals and objectives. And then the, the next step that we typically would go through is to assess the current business processes. So map out, you know, at a high level, the current processes and where the big low hanging fruit opportunities for improvement are. Um, a lot of times um, there's, there's two, there's two um, sets of risks here or challenges that organizations face, and they're sort of opposite ends of the spectrum. One end of the spectrum is that organizations um, feel like they don't need to worry about their current processes because they want to forget about it. You know, we don't like our current processes. So why are we going to talk about it? Let's just focus on getting new technology and put new technology in place. Okay, that may be true. I, I would challenge, usually I challenge that and say, well, there's, there's, surely there's got to be some stuff within your organization that's good that you know you want to retain and keep. Otherwise, you wouldn't be successful. You wouldn't be competitive in your, your industry and you wouldn't be effective as an organization, um, even, even with technology that's outdated. So that's one risk is that we, we tend to oversimplify and say that, well, let's not worry about current state. Let's focus on future state. And that's true. You don't want to get into too much detail, but you do need to understand where we're starting from because that helps us, first of all, prioritize where the opportunities for improvement are. But from an organizational change perspective, it helps us connect the dots between where we are today and how that's going to change in the future. And it's really hard for change people to be effective if they don't do so in the context of where we're grounded today. Whether we like it or not, that is what it is. That's where we are. And that's what people understand. So how do we how do we translate this and do this in a way that that allows people to um, to get to that level of where they need to be in the future. 
So that's one challenge on one extreme is that organizations say, we don't need to worry about current state. We don't need to worry about processes. We're just going to start deploying technology and that's going to drive the processes for us. Now, the other extreme, which is also risky and a, and a challenge in, in and of itself, is that you do some process work up front, but you do too much of it. You end up overanalyzing every single nook and cranny of the organization, stuff that may be relevant in some cases, but in many cases, it's not relevant because it is going to go away. So the way you know I tend to think about it is if you sort of imagine high level business processes, super high level, and then down here, you've got super detailed business processes, which are transactional, you know, step-by-step, -step, what screen you go to, what buttons you push, all that stuff. The stuff down at the bottom doesn't matter. You don't need to be overanalyzing and re-engineering that stuff yet because you don't know what the technology is and the technology is going to help you enable much of that. But you can start at the top and sort of work your way down. And once you bump up against sort of an imaginary line or a subjective line that is dependent on what technology you deploy, that's where you stop. You don't want to go past that line because it's it's a moot point in many cases and you're over analyzing at that point and you're spinning your wheels because you don't know what the technology is going to be. So, um, and that's for the future state definition I'm, I'm talking about there. But even with your current state, um, when you're talking about current state, you don't want to spend a lot of time over analyzing, but you do want to have that general flow and understanding of how how our processes work now, where the pain points are, um, not at the detailed transactional level, but just more at the general workflow level. So that then we can say, okay, here are the areas we want to improve. And then here's what the business case is to, you know, the benefits we expect to get out of it, which I'll, I'll get to that here in a few minutes. So assessing current processes is, is a is a important next step. We're here playing you a mashup of some of the past Digital Stratosphere conferences. Our new, our latest upcoming Digital Stratosphere conference is going to be October 4th through the 6th in Denver, Colorado. You can learn more about that at stratosphere2023.com. You can see the speaker lineup, the agenda, the pricing, all that good stuff, stratosphere2023.com. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and keep playing you this, this mashup of other uh, speakers that we have had at past conferences. So stick around. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 135. We're here playing you a mashup of past Digital Stratosphere conference events, just to give you a flavor of what to expect at our next Digital Stratosphere, which is coming up in October, October 4, 5, and 6 in Denver, Colorado. You can learn more about the event and see the lineup at stratosphere2023.com. But in the meantime, let's jump back into the mashup of past events that we've hosted. And then also assessing your current organization. So really understanding um, not just the the step-by-step -step processes and the operations of the organization, but the organization itself, the human side of it. So what, you know, in addition to processes, we want to look at what kind of skills we have, how we organized uh, in terms of reporting relationship, what are the roles and responsibilities? What are those potential impacts that we already know, even at the early stages of a project, a lot of times we'll know and uncover um, big picture sorts of changes that we know are going to be significant to the organization or certain parts of the organization. And um, really defining what those future uh, state needs are. Another important part of this too is really understanding the culture of the organization and 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 what what it where it is you are today and and how you intend or want to bend the culture. Um, you're not going to change it overnight. You're not going to take a hundred years or however long you've been in business or existed as an organization. You're not going to take decades or more of you know culture development. And you're not going to change it overnight in a year or two you know, as part of a transformation, but we can start deliberately bending the culture and shifting the needle in a certain direction. Um, 
just to give you an example, a lot of organizations we work with are high growth companies. They've, you know, maybe they're family owned or maybe they're private equity owned. They've grown up from being a, you know, say a $50 million organization up to hundreds of millions or sometimes in the billions. And in that transition, you know, they, the culture hasn't kept up or hasn't evolved fast enough to enable, you know, where they're headed in, in the breakneck speed they might be growing at. So, you know, when, when they were a $50 million organization, as an example, that's a lot different type of culture. It's more of entrepreneurial shooting from the hip flexibility is generally valued. But then when you become a, say a billion dollar organization or, or bigger, you need a different culture, a different mindset. You can be somewhat entrepreneurial, but you need to start to add in doses of, you know, efficiency and scale and things of that nature and repeatability, predictability, you know, in some cases, things that are, that are considered bad words or maybe taboo in your organization, but you, you need to end up shifting in that direction oftentimes. So we have to think about, well, what's the culture today and what is it we need it to be more like in the future and how can we start bending that culture and what are some of the things we can be doing from a change perspective to start to bend the, bend the culture and move the needle that way. And that's another, um, by the way, this whole concept of culture and organizational alignment, that's a whole nother component or aspect of misalignment um, that I was alluding to before. Um, even if we've done those first two steps I've talked about so far, we have clear articulation of our strategy. We've defined and assessed our processes, but then our organization and where we're headed as the organization itself, if that's not aligned, then the first two steps are gonna get severely undermined. So evaluating that organization is an important um, next step for certain. And then just sort of completing out the whole people process and technology trifecta here, uh, we've covered people in process. Now you get to the technology. How do we assess those current systems and the current architecture? And this is looking at a few different angles. One is, you know, what applications do you have in place? Um, you know, we have a, we have a client right now. It's a it's a larger um, organization in the healthcare industry, and we're having a really difficult time with this client. Or our team is having a really difficult time just getting a handle on what all the systems are that this organization has. Just because they've they've grown through acquisition, they're multinational. And there's just all these, you know, call it black market or, you know, underground types of systems that have popped up over the years that no one person seems to be aware of. So we're, you know, poking around just trying to figure out what systems are here and what systems ultimately are we going to replace and which ones ultimately might we want to keep or need to keep for regulatory or functionality sorts of reasons. And so assessing and understanding what those current systems are is important. Your, your overall infrastructure, even if you're gonna to move to a cloud environment, you need to understand sort of what is that infrastructure look like now? How might it look in the future? Or if for some reason you're gonna retain some on-prem systems and maybe you're doing more of a hybrid where some stuff will be in the cloud, some will be on-prem. What does that architecture need to look like going forward? And then there's also uh, another piece of this too, which is really important is not just the physical uh, systems and architecture, but also just the organizational um, infrastructure. So understanding what um, our IT department in particular, our IT and related technical support groups, if you have like a, um, you know, business systems group or whatever that might be outside of IT, but more at the functional level, anyone that's dealing with systems, you want to understand what those skills are and those competencies are that you have in-house. Because chances are, even if you're doing an upgrade, um, like we talked about yesterday, we talked about how moving from SAP ECC to S4 HANA as an example, that's a pretty big shift in terms of skill sets, competencies, technical proficiency, technical needs, all that stuff, because it's a whole new system. It's even though it's SAP, it's a whole new system. It's a rewrite, new platform, new architecture, new database, all that stuff. And the same is true for Oracle and Microsoft and a lot of these other vendors that have been around for a long time with, with uh, legacy systems. So you really need to understand what are the skills we have now and, and what are they going to be in the future? And that's especially true if you're making a pretty dramatic change, if you're moving from an old legacy system to some unrelated new vendor, um, that's an even bigger shift than if you're moving from a, you know, SAP S4 HANA or SAP ECC to S4 HANA. Um, that's still a big shift, but not as big as if you're moving from some homegrown system to a, a modern ERP system. So we want to understand those skills and competencies because chances are our IT department, our IT group, our IT competency itself is going to need to shift significantly. And, and it may be a matter of uh, upskilling people. It may be a matter of bringing on new team members. It could be a matter of re removing team members. It could be a matter of uh, outsourcing certain things to third parties. Um, whatever it is, we need to figure out the lay of the land of where we are today and what the gap is with what we need in the future from a 
organizational and a physical infrastructure perspective. So the, the next thing, uh, step five here is to assess current performance measures. So we want to look at, you know, what measures you're using to drive the business right now. And, you know, that could be obviously something as simple as, you, you know, overall profitability and SG&A costs and, you know, high, high level P&L line items. That's certainly important. But what's even more uh, important is to get down to that next level of operational detail. What sort of metrics are important to you as an organization, whether it be Something like uh, inventory turns, inventory accuracy, um, you know, uh, total time to close the books for period end close. Um, what's the average lead time for customers? All that sort of stuff. You want to look at all these metrics and really understand, you know, where are we performing well and where could we be performing better? And how could technology or process improvements or organizational improvements or all of the above, how could our transformation enable improvements in some of those, those areas? And some of those those performance measures, and again, it's all about it's all about doing two things here. One is to create a business case, not just for justification for the project. Um, although I'll say that most clients we work with really resist the idea of a business case for justification purposes because there's so many organizations right now, and this problem is getting worse. You know, the longer I'm in this industry, and the, the more technology changes. And, and that problem is that organizations say, "Well, we don't need a business case because we have to change." You know, technology is moved this far ahead and we're still back here in the 80s you know when we built our legacy system so there's really no business case to talk about we have to upgrade okay well that's that's probably true or it may be true but it's it's the the other issue or the, the bigger issue that a business case addresses is that it gives you better clarity and governance around how the transformation is going to work so when you look at something like you know average inventory turns if that's a pain point for you right now and you're sitting on too much inventory and you're trying to free up capital cost um, to, as a result, there's a benefit there. There's an estimated benefit that may or may not justify the project, but even if it doesn't justify the project, at the very least, what's even more important is that it, it gives us direction on the project to know that inventory turns is a big deal to us and we've got to figure out a way to tackle inventory turns. And so then think, you know, cast your mind forward to the mid middle of a transformation, you know, someone comes forward and says, hey, I want to customize the software. I don't like the way it works out of the box. And this, this will happen to you if it hasn't happened already, it's going to happen to you at some point. So, you know, consider this uh, prep for uh, that, that sort of change management issue that, that inevitably will happen at some point along the way. So someone comes forward and says, um, Hey, I want to customize the software. And then you say, why, or, or uh, better yet, you, know, you might just say, no, we're not customizing. We already decided we're not doing any customization. Well, so you end up making arbitrary decisions without really having context or a business case of well, why do you want to why do you want to customize? Well, just is it just because, or is it because it actually enables some of these performance metrics that we've defined as high priorities to the organization? And it may be that it, let's just say just to throw out random numbers, it's going to cost us fifty thousand dollars to change something in the system. It's going to introduce a certain amount of risk, but it's going to increase our ability to optimize inventory turns by whatever amount. Um, in that case, maybe it's worth it. Maybe there's a maybe there's a positive ROI there and we make an exception and say, okay, we will customize in this case, but only because we can tie it back to the business case and only because there's a clear ROI on it. Um, and that helps you differentiate between the, the um, legitimate customization request or changes to scope versus the, hey, we just don't wanna change because we've always done it this way types of request. And without that business case, you're gonna either assume that they're all signs of resistance and you're going to say no or try to say no to everyone or you're going to get steamrolled steamrolled as a project team because again the path of least resistance is just to go ahead and customize because you don't want to deal with the politics or the, the personality conflicts of of uh of saying no so that's just an example of how a clear set of performance measures can give you clear direction and governance on an overall uh, project like that and it also gives you um, clear direction on how what you're reporting um, capabilities and requirements are. So that's another important uh, secondary benefit of, of defining your performance measures is it gives you a head start to where you can make sure that during the transformation that you are creating the analytics and the visibility and the reporting in a way that um, supports what it is you're trying to accomplish. And it doesn't become an afterthought. Too often the whole reporting analytics data concept ends up becoming sort of a downstream last minute, oh yeah, we need to get this done real quick before implementation sort of thing. Whereas this is a, an opportunity to pull it forward and say, no, we're, we're going to be more strategic and more deliberate about this stuff and how we how we tackle it. 
And then what we, we do here is we, we then, after we've done all those first five steps, then we start to look at, well, what are our options? You know, what are our viable alternatives to accomplish all the things that we just defined over however many weeks or months that we spend doing steps one through five? And this is where you look at, again, not either or answers, but usually these are sort of continuum type of answers. It's not, you know, do you want a new software? Yes or no. It's, or it's not even, do you want a single ERP? Yes or no. It's usually, you know, do you want to lean more towards a single ERP system? You're probably not going to get all the way there, but, you know, do we want to lean that way? Or are we leaning more towards, say, a best of breed approach where we have sales and finance and warehouse management and other parts of the organization go out and find their own technologies or we find the best technologies for each of those groups and then we figure out a way to tie it all together. Chances are, you know, most organizations are somewhere in the middle, but we need to figure out where as an organization we're leaning based on all the stuff we've done um, earlier in these first five steps. And, you know, this is where the whole concept of silver bullets, um, this is a good anecdote to that uh, or antidote to silver bullets the silver bullet myth. This is a way to say, this is who we are as an organization um, and from a people process technology and strategy perspective and a performance measure perspective. Now, here are the options that best align with what it is we are and what we're trying to become. And it's not as simple as saying, well, you know, if, if you ask SAP or if you ask, you know, NetSuite or uh, Microsoft Dynamics or a VAR of one of theirs, if you ask them to define your roadmap or your strategy for you, it's obviously going to be very product centric, focused on how their product can do everything that you just defined in steps one through five. Well, chances are they probably can. So, you know, let's, let's be a little bit more agnostic about that and figure out what those decisions are, which will then lead us to the best options in the marketplace. Um, and this is oftentimes a way that we'll will um, use to get to either a, a short long list or, a, or an overall short list of potential options or systems is just based on some of these different parameters that we lay out. And no matter what direction we lay out, and at this point, we're looking at sort of high level um, strategic direction. So for example, let's assume that our stated goal or our stated path or one of our stated paths or options is to implement a tier one ERP system. Um, it could be SAP or Oracle, maybe Microsoft. We don't know yet, but it's it, that's the general path we're considering. So we want to look at what does that option look like in general without getting into software evaluation and selection yet, which we're going to cover that later today, I believe, or, or uh, tomorrow, I think it is. Um, but even before then, you know, what sort of systems are we looking for? Are we looking for best of breed, tier one ERP, tier two, industry focused solution, some sort of custom solution, um, whatever it may be. You know, we want to have general direction, compare the total cost of ownership, do a sort of a cost benefit analysis of these different paths, and then assess these different paths in the context of how does that align with our overall strategy. And what ends up happening is a lot of times you, you won't even consider certain paths because they're not aligned um, with your strategy and others you might narrow down to, you know, two or three different paths you could go down and then you sort of narrow in or hone in on um, what those those pros and cons and trade offs are for those those different alternatives. So that's that next step here is to define what those viable alternatives are. Um, what are the general sort of paths that we could take? And usually we'll try to put together, it seems like three is a good number for most organizations. I'm, I'm not sure why, it just seems like a good, it's a good um, way to sort of narrow down to three most viable options. And it's a good way to, to compare them side by side so you can pick one direction that makes the most sense for you as an organization. Or, or if it ends up being a hybrid, you can define a clear path forward among those three. But generally, we'll lay out three scenarios. You know, one might be, you know, implement a global tier one ERP system. Another one might be, you know, implement uh, best of breed um, types of solutions at a localized level. And then, you know, I don't know what the third one is, something different. So you have three different options or potential paths. You assess them and you assess in the terms of alignment with the organizational goals and objectives, with the, uh, the ability to improve business processes, the ability to deliver an ROI, and you, you compare those and ultimately you pick a path forward based on those, those alternatives. And then once you look at those, each of those alternatives, you're also defining, um, usually once you've picked one of those paths, I should say, usually then we'd say, okay, we looked at these three different paths we could take. We're, we're settling in or honing in on this one that seems to make the most sense for whatever reason or whatever reasons. And now if we were to go down that path, here's what that three to five year plan looks like. Here's what the cost benefit looks like. Here's what the ROI is. Here's what the overall risk profile is. Here's how we're going to mitigate those risks. And, um, you know, this is the overall alignment with the organization. And 
some of that you you know you inherently start to do in the, the the assessment of the three paths forward or the three options forward, but here you you really dive a little bit deeper into it to defining it in a in more little more granularity in terms of how we're going to uh, roll out the overall transformation. And then you also want to define a business case and benefits realization plan based on that specific path. So earlier we talked about general performance measures and sort of what are those metrics that are important to the business. You start to get into a little bit of what are some of the goals we want to achieve, or at least what are some of the improvements we want to make. But here, when we get to the business case, this is where we really start to define it in terms of dollars and cents. The, those benefits that we talked about with performance measures, if we get on this path, these are the benefits we expect. This is the cost that we expect to see. And then this is the overall uh, ROI. And, you know, again, we don't know what software is yet. We haven't gotten RFPs or proposals typically at this point, or, you know, maybe we have, I mean, everyone handles this a little bit different or everyone's at different stages of their journey. So we, we do end up tweaking this based on uh, client needs, but in a perfect world, you know, you would do this before you start the procurement process and have a pretty clear vision at a high level, at least um, uh, of where, you know, what some of those ROI components are. And, and with the overall benefits realization plan. And that's the other key part of this too, is it's not just a justification exercise here. This is also a way to define what the actual benefits are. And this this goes back to uh, Dave Beldick's presentation yesterday, and he's actually gonna do another one uh, tomorrow about um, uh, benefits optimization, uh, optimizing and getting your, your transformation on track. So sort of that post implementation optimization approach that becomes a lot easier when you have a business case up front. So um, I, I talked about how a business case can be a great project governance tool during the transformation to help you make decisions. But what's just as important, maybe even more important is after implementation. Now you have a benefits realization plan that you can manage to, to say, okay, you know, spoiler alert, we didn't get all the benefits we expected on day one. And I, I wouldn't expect that anyone here on this call is going to on day one, but there's some benefits we, we are achieving, which is great. And there's a lot we're not. So let's hone in on the ones we're not. Why are we not hitting these? Uh, why, are, why are we not performing to the level that we expect in you know all these different areas that we outlined in our business case? And let's get to the root cause of, of why, why that is. And I actually think this is the, if I had to pick one part of a project, or it's one of two, I should say, it's one of two parts of a project that I enjoy the most. It's that benefits optimization because it is so, I don't wanna say it's easy, but it, compared to all the pain you just go through in, in a transformation, to now go optimize and really look at root causes of why are we not getting the um, the performance we want out of the system or out of the process or out of the people or all the above, you know, th that work is relatively light compared to all the heavy lifting that goes into the transformation itself. And the value is super high. So if you have to pick an area where you're gonna get the most value, it's gonna be in that benefits realization area. But the problem is once you go live, everyone's sort of like, they're just done with it. They're ready to go back to their jobs. They, they declare victory or, or not. Either way, they sort of go back to their their jobs and, and let it be. So if you can spend time optimizing and, and really fine tuning, um, that benefits realization plan is going to help you get a lot more value out of the transformation so that ultimately you don't end up having to do this again anytime soon. I mean, that's ultimately the goal here is to let's figure out something that gives us a really strong foundation that we don't have to go replace again anytime soon. We might constantly be tweaking and adapting and improving over time, but we don't want to have to build something that's sort of a, you know, call it a second stage, moderate failure. We want to, we want to have something that's, that's a good success that gives us a really solid starting point for today, two, three, four or five years from now, it might be that we have to keep upgrading and changing and improving. And that's okay. We don't want to have to go through this process again. And, and the better we handle benefits realization, the less likely that's to happen. And then you want to define your change management plan. So what are those components of change in the strategy that's going to it best enable the transformation components that we've just talked about or that you've articulated and defined in the first eight steps. And we're going to have a, another session on organizational change that will go into this in more detail with, with um, Nate later today. Um, that's where we get into things like assessment, ownership, alignment, agility, um, all these sorts of things. And then there's also other tactics and tools that are used during the change uh, process. But the idea here is we want to talk about at a high level, what is the change strategy um, and what are those biggest risk, biggest picture uh, changes and, and issues that we're going to have to manage as part of our change management program. Because ultimately, if there's, you know, just a handful of maybe two or three things that most commonly delay a project, change management is one of them. 
or lack thereof. So if we don't move this change management stuff up front to our strategy phase, then chances are higher that change management is going to be the thing that delays our project or lack of change management will be the thing that delays our project. So the better we can define this stuff um, early up front, uh, the better off we're going to be. All right, good stuff. Well, thank you for that mashup, Kyler. You you assembled that for us and, and pulled together some curated clips of past digital stratosphere events. Um, again, you can register for our upcoming stratosphere event in October in Denver, Colorado. You can go to stratosphere2023.com. Uh, what are some of your thoughts and takeaways after seeing the mashup and having this discussion here about uh, digital stratosphere, Kyler? Yeah, definitely. So some big takeaways here. Um, Digital Stratosphere is obviously um, a great conference to join us for. We gave you that special promo code for our ground control listeners here of Stratosphere 20. Dot, or I'm sorry, um, Stratosphere 20 is the promo code. Uh, so two zero. Um, and we'll we'll place that in the description link too, so that you can not forget it in the times that I've stumbled over it. And then, um, also we have obviously the the final countdown, which is the book in which um, Eric has launched. And at Stratosphere, you actually will get a free copy with um, registration and he will sign it too for our VIP ticket holders. And you kind of get to have a fireside chat about the book um, and all of those those different things. Um, so you are able to buy that book right now. If you go to Amazon and search Final Countdown or click the link below, you're able to um, get that. Obviously, in previous episodes, we've read some um, chapters as well. So if you haven't checked those out, um, you'll want to go back and kind of listen to, we have chapters 9, 10, 1, and 2 uh, available in previous episodes. Uh, so that's something that's, that's really exciting. And then lastly, of all the homework we've given you, we have the 2024 Digital Operations Report which now features our top 10 systems. So if you sign up for that, you'll be notified when the full report is out, again, um, in the link in the description. If you ever have any questions, you can tag me in the comments here, and I'm happy to kind of direct you to all of the great thought leadership we have going on in the marketplace um, as far as how we can support you in your transformation journey. Um, you can also reach out to me directly if you have any questions about your project or anything like that at kyler.cheatham at thirdstage-consulting.com. So just kind of wrap everything up, put a bow on it as we've had a very dense, heavy episode, but lots of takeaways for our audience here. Yeah, my head's spinning. All the, the books I need to read, the conferences I need to attend, the papers I need to download. Uh, but it's here, you know, we're providing these resources. I know, we've got a lot going on. Right, right. Well, good. Well, uh, yeah, hopefully you find these resources helpful and be sure to check any or all of them out as you see fit. And uh, we're here to help however you need to. So feel free to reach out to us with questions too as you uh, navigate your digital transformation journey and do your research and homework and due diligence behind it as well. So I want to thank you for joining here today. Thank you, Kyler, for another great episode. Thank you to the audience for great questions and engagement. Appreciate everyone being here. We'll see you next week on Transformation Ground Control. Hope you have a great week in the meantime, and we'll see you soon. Take care.